I remember stumbling upon the reservation just as the sun began to set behind the Grand Mesa in Colorado. My name is Talon Red Elk, a native to the Ute tribe. I had decided to hike through these woods, my ancestral lands, as a way to reconnect with my heritage. During my trek, I came across clumps of hair and shreds of clothing dangling from trees or scattered on the ground. The eerie silence that surrounded me only served to amplify the sense of unease that was steadily building up within me. As darkness enveloped the landscape, I settled down near a small creek for the night. This area had felt familiar and safer than other parts one had crossed during my day-long hike. The ambient sounds of flowing water and fluttering wings provided some comfort amidst the strangeness. While preparing a fire to keep myself warm, I caught wind of distant cries in the night. The desperate screams begged for help. They sounded faint and distorted yet were unmistakably human. I need your help, cried a distant voice. My instincts kicked into action, and I followed the sound through tangled underbrush and darkness. When I finally emerged into a small clearing, what had happened took my breath away. In front of me lay a gruesome scene. Pieces of bodies were strewn about, barely recognizable as human anymore. Paralyzed with shock, my mind raced to process what could have caused such devastation. It must have been a wild animal lurking in these woods. But this kind of brutality felt all too unfamiliar. Why didn't you scream for help? I whispered to myself as I stared at the remnants of whoever or whatever this was that lay before me. A slow guttural growl sent chills down my spine as my eyes darted towards its source. There it stood, part animal, part something else entirely, an eight-foot-tall blend of flesh and fur with piercing yellow eyes that seemed to seep into my soul. It moved with the grace of a predator— stalking closer toward me as I stood transfixed by its presence. Sudden clarity surged through me, a lightning bolt of realization. I needed to get away from this creature. This monster that could have attacked any Native American reservation, at any point in time, was now facing me. My heart pounded in my chest as I scrambled for an escape. Desperate to survive, I grabbed a fallen branch beside me and started swinging wildly. The creature remained unfazed as if amused by my attempts to fight back. Is that all you've got? The creature seemed to snicker at me. Its grin revealed rows of razor-sharp teeth, each set upon taking my life away. Don't come any closer! I shouted with defiance through labored breaths. Still, panic surged within me. The beast proved relentless in its pursuit. The gasps for air felt like fire in my lungs as I put more distance between us. Glancing behind, I saw it gaining on me fast before throwing my makeshift weapon at it with all the strength I could muster. The futile effort earned a mere second's reprieve. The creature lunged at me, its grotesque claws outstretched. I could feel the rush of air as it narrowly missed slicing through my flesh. My legs trembled as I continued to sprint through the dense forest, feeling every brush against a tree or twig as they whipped my body along the way. Help! I screamed at the top of my lungs, gasping for breath as I hoped somebody would hear me and come to my rescue. But deep down, I knew nobody would be able to save me. Faintly, I heard voices in the distance, fellow campers at the site where I'd been staying. My heart leaped with hope, but then the creature let out another blood-curdling screech that echoed through the woods, drowning out all other sounds. I stumbled on a tree root and crashed to the ground. Instantly, I felt its massive weight slam into me. It pinned me down with ease, and for a moment, I caught sight of its face— or rather, faces, as it appeared to have several cramped into one twisted mass. Its teeth gnashed mere inches from my own face as it held me captive beneath it. No! 
I shouted, slamming my fists against its leathery hide. The creature seemed invulnerable to any damage I could inflict. Knowing my attempts were futile, my thoughts raced for any possible way to escape this nightmare. As if sensing my thoughts, it pressed its grotesque face closer to mine and whispered something that sounded like words but was somehow wrong. It spoke in a voice like a hundred tortured souls. Each word sent paralyzing terror coursing through me. With no options left to me, I did the only thing I could think of, pray. Despite having never been religious, at that moment those words comforting enough that they brought a shred of hope. For inexplicable reasons, the creature stopped its advance. It tilted its head, listening, and released its grip on me. I scrambled backward, watching as it skulked off into the night. The voices in the distance grew louder, and soon my friends appeared on the forest path. They had heard my calls for help and had come searching. What happened? One of them asked breathlessly. A creature. I replied hesitantly, still shaken by the experience. It attacked me. We need to report this. Another insisted. Maybe they can track it down. Yet somehow, I knew that whatever this being was, it wouldn't be tracked or killed like a regular beast. It was an entirely different level of horror and monstrosity. We left the campsite that night without hesitation. As we drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever lurked in that forest might still follow me. That I could never truly escape it. Over time, I shared this story with others only to find them skeptical and dismissive, brushing it off as a ridiculous tale. Eventually, I stopped talking about it altogether. The memory of that night continued to haunt me in my sleep. As days turned into months and then into years, my fear slowly converted into curiosity. What was that thing? Where did it come from? And why did it let me live? With reluctance and determination driving me onward, I traveled back to the forest where my encounter had taken place. Prepared for anything despite knowing that there's no way of fully understanding what happened on that horrific night many years ago. I took a deep breath as I stood at the entrance of the now overgrown path leading back to where my life had been shaken to its core. Though consumed by fear and uncertainty, a smaller part of me hoped that by uncovering some truth about this creature, I might find closure or even some semblance of redemption. I stepped forward onto the path, ready to face whatever awaited me and determined to solve the mystery that had tormented me for years. As I did, I couldn't shake the feeling that something, or someone, was watching me from the shadows, waiting for my return. I stumbled upon something unusual in the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest, working as a park ranger. The name's James Clearwater, a proud Native American of the Salish tribe. My friends teased me about my last name, joking that it sounded like a hipster water brand. Little did I know, something darker awaited me in those woods. While on my usual patrol, I discovered an improvised campsite. Its sole inhabitant appeared to be a middle-aged man covered in dirt and dried blood, doubly strange due to the nearest reservation being miles away. As I approached him cautiously, he muttered fearfully about something stalking him through the shadows, yet he didn't call for help because he believed no one would come. As days passed by, more people on the reservation shared similar eerie experiences, each one more disturbing than the last. Recently, reports of violent attacks were increasing with little to no evidence or clues left behind for us to decipher. A sense of panic spread among our close-knit community. My best friend Thomas Greycloud became one of the many missing persons without any trace or explanation. We formed search parties scouring every inch of the dense woods but found nothing. 
His disappearance led us to question if this mysterious creature that everybody feared was somehow connected to all these horrifying incidents. Only when my path crossed with this dread-inspiring beast did everything become terrifyingly clear. While investigating another report near Mica Mountain, I encountered the culprit, an animalistic creature unlike anything I had ever seen before or could have imagined. Its elongated limbs resembled gnarled tree branches and its skin-covered body had an odd texture akin to a blend of bark and rotting flesh. The antler-like protrusions from its head completed its ghastly appearance alongside its unnaturally large fangs glimmering under the moonlight. The creature lunged at me with animalistic ferocity while I scrambled to dodge its deadly grasp, adrenaline pumping through my veins as I stumbled away from its persistent pursuit. Every breath felt like a combination of sandpaper and smoke in my desperate lungs. Thomas's wife, Elizabeth Featherstone, joined me in unraveling this monstrous enigma. Reclusive and usually quiet, she possessed an extensive knowledge of our people's history and folklore. As we pored over dusty old books together, we learned about ancient Salish myths said to contain details about this creature's abilities and weaknesses. Rumors circulated that the government might be involved, sending shivers down our spines as the possibility of their ties to this horrifying being haunted our thoughts. However, we committed ourselves to unearthing the truth while trying to keep our findings under wraps away from those who could jeopardize our mission. Our plan led us into the deep forest, armed with what knowledge we had assembled. It was just a pinch past sundown when we set up our trap, employing traditional methods of camouflage and luring the monster with a mixture of animal scents that Elizabeth had concocted herself. As we awaited patiently in breathless silence concealed in a makeshift deer blind nearby, the hours seemed to drag on like an endless nightmare. Our anticipation grew until it finally arrived, the abominable beast cautiously creeping toward our bait, seemingly aware that something was amiss. The tension in the air intensified as Elizabeth murmured a battle cry before signaling me to charge out from hiding with her. She swung a firebrand towards its hideous face while I slammed my fist against it. As we struggled with the creature under a thick moonlit canopy, it wielded its colossal antlers wildly with frightening aggression and snapped them close to my eyes. I could hear my thudding heart echoing in my ears as if time itself had slowed down. In sheer panic, I pulled out my hunting knife and slashed it through the air, tearing through one of its arms before it let out an earth-shattering roar. Elizabeth frantically reached for the rifle strapped to her back and shot twice at its gaping maw. The deafening gunfire was drowned by the creature's haunting screams. Both Elizabeth and I were aware that although we wanted to capture the monstrosity alive, our lives now depended on not showing any hesitation. I gripped my hunting knife tightly while Elizabeth reloaded her rifle. In our adrenaline-induced frenzy, either of us noticed that the beast had managed to wound Elizabeth's arm during the struggle. She winced and gritted her teeth as she continued to prepare her weapon, determined not to let it slow her down. As I managed to dodge another deadly swipe of its claws, I realized that we couldn't keep up this confrontation indefinitely. Our best option would be to call for help, but there was no guarantee that anyone would make it in time or even believe our frantic cries for assistance. The forest was vast, and we had already gone so deep in search of the creature that few would dare enter these seemingly endless depths. With no time for debate, we pushed on, motivated by our survival instincts. Cover me! I shouted as I charged at it again with my knife drawn, aiming for a vital area that could force the creature into submission or at least ward it off temporarily. Elizabeth focused her aim carefully and fired a few more shots with frightening precision. The beast reeled back from each shot but didn't collapse as we had hoped. Instead, it grew even more enraged. Its massive form crashed through the surrounding trees as it charged towards us with an unearthly speed. Its body was covered in thick fur that seemed unnatural for any creature of this size, making its movements eerily silent as it relentlessly pursued us. 
we were unable to outrun such an abomination. Its sheer power and determination left us no other choice but to stand our ground and attempt one final confrontation. Desperation forced us to dig deep within ourselves for the strength we didn't know we possessed. Constrained by space during the chase, Elizabeth had resorted to using her rifle as a blunt weapon, striking the creature whenever it had dared to rush her. However, during one of these desperate attempts, her rifle shattered against of its hardened legs, leaving her with only the jagged remnants as a makeshift weapon. I screamed in terror and grasped my useless knife, my hands shaking uncontrollably. We locked eyes for a moment, acknowledging that this could be our last stand. It was a moment of unspoken understanding and mutual respect. Inch by inch, we adjusted ourselves, positioning our bodies to use every ounce of strength for one final attack. My earlier attempt to slash at it had left deep gashes in the beast's arm, large enough for me to reach inside and tear off some muscle tissue with my knife clutched firmly in my hands. Meanwhile, Elizabeth aimed at where she thought would be a vulnerable point with the remnants of her rifle. With one coordinated effort inspired by sheer desperation, we unleashed our offensive actions upon the menacing organism. It felt as if time hung in suspension, making our movements almost lethargic before they eventually collided with unnerving force. I felt a surge of triumph as my knife plunged deep into the beast's fleshy interior, forcing blood to spew outward with a horrifying gush. Simultaneously, Elizabeth drove the shattered end of her rifle through its eye socket shattered the beast's skull like glass. An eerie silence fell over us as our heartbeats slowed down and our mission finally came to an end. The creature lay lifeless at our feet with no indication as to what horror it originated from or what nightmare lurked within its DNA. Bruised and battered, Elizabeth and I stood over the corpse in shock at what we had accomplished. We had gone after the truth but had discovered more than we could have ever imagined. Somehow, wordlessly, we both knew that what had taken place in these woods should never leave us. The forest gradually swallowed our secret as Elizabeth, and I made our way out of its depths to reconstruct our lives. The creature's vicious attack left scars and wounds that served as chilling reminders of the horrors that slumbered beneath the earth's surface, waiting to awake when least expected. Despite the burden of knowledge resting on our shoulders— we had learned an invaluable truth, the limits of human potential when cornered by an impossible nightmare. And thus, our story remained between us, a haunting testament for eternity. I stumbled upon a broken cell phone near Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Its screen shattered like my world would soon be. My name is Koenna Blackhawk, and I work as a forest ranger in these parts. I've seen my share of unsettling events around here, but nothing could have prepared me for what was about to unfold. As I picked up the remnants of the phone, I noticed dried blood smeared on the shattered screen. The pine trees around me seemed to whisper in the icy wind, as though they knew something I didn't. My gut churned with unease, but my duty as a forest ranger compelled me to search for whoever might have dropped the phone. Footprints led deeper into the woods, away from the usual trails, following them cautiously but urgently. The sun dipped lower and lower in the sky, casting shadows that stretched longer with every step. My unease grew stronger as I came upon a seemingly abandoned campsite. The fire pit held cold ashes and half-burnt wood, and all around lay overturned chairs and scattered belongings. A tent flapped violently against the wind's icy grasp. Inside was an unmade bed soaked with blood far too much blood to hope for anyone's survival. An ominous feeling washed over me then like unseen eyes observing my every move. My instincts screamed at me to call for backup, but there was no reception in this deep expanse of pine and darkness. 
as darkness swallowed what little daylight remained, I cautiously ventured further following more tracks, a mix of human footprints and something unrecognizable. Deeper towards a cave entrance concealed behind gnarled branches and sharp rocks jutting from the earth. My flashlight sliced through the gloom of the cave's yawning maw as I stepped inside. Cold sweat trickled down my back despite layers of protective clothing shielding me from nature's frigid breath. Though I wanted to turn back then, I had gone too far to abandon my search. Deeper and deeper I ventured, my senses heightened with every echoing drip of water and crunch of gravel beneath my boots. Suddenly, I heard gasps and whimpers coming from the darkness ahead, as if someone had stumbled upon a sight horrors from which they could not escape. I quickened my pace, entering a larger chamber where several people huddled together, two adults, one clutching a wounded arm tightly as they sobbed and a wide-eyed child trembling violently beside them. "'What happened?' I demanded gently, the terror in their eyes rendering them near speechless. With her arm cradled in his protective embrace, the wounded woman choked out a description of the creature that attacked them, something neither human nor animal but possessing a nightmarish combination of both. Their descriptions painted a disturbing image— eight feet tall with an elongated snout, and rows of razor-sharp teeth that could rip through flesh like paper. Its hulking form was cloaked in matted fur with additional patches of rough scales adorning its predatory body. But perhaps most horrifying were its eyes, yellow orbs that seemed to pierce the very soul yet betrayed no semblance of humanity. Determined to protect the terrified huddle, I led them slowly back towards the entrance, constantly glancing over my shoulder to spot any lurking shadow or sign of pursuit. The rustling wind gnawed at my nerves, whipping up flurries of dead leaves that skittered like phantom footsteps just beyond reach. However, our attempt to escape proved futile as we entered one cavern only for me to see those haunting yellow eyes glow menacingly from within the enveloping shadows. The creature emerged from its inky lair even more horrifying than described relentlessly stalking towards us with teeth bared and claws poised to strike. In desperation, I drew my gun and took aim at the fearsome creature. Knowing I could not kill it, my hope lay only in slowing our merciless pursuer long enough to escape its reach. The cold metal numbed my fingers as I squeezed the trigger releasing a deafening volley of gunshots. To my dismay, my bullets found their mark yet did little to deter the monster's impending advance. With only moments to spare, the wounded man had a brilliant, albeit dangerous, idea. He doused the creature in a bottle of high-proof liquor that he had carried from the campsite. The injured man's impulsive act caught my attention. Realizing that high-proof liquor on the creature's body provided me with a chance, I repeated his move, throwing one more bottle of liquor onto the beast. The alcohol splashed across its body, drenching its already filthy fur with the flammable liquid. Panic surged through me as it continued to advance, undeterred by our desperate attempts. With trembling hands, I pulled a match from my pocket and struck it against the nearest wall in a last-ditch effort to repel our assailant. The small flame burned brightly as I threw it towards the creature. As soon as the fire touched its saturated fur, the monstrous being erupted into flames. An ear-piercing screech filled the air as it writhed in agony, thrashing wildly in an attempt to extinguish itself. But none of us had time to spare— so we hurriedly pressed on towards the exit. Noticing a forked path ahead, we had to make a quick decision. However, one of our group members noticed a faint hint of fresh air coming from the left passage. Without wasting any time or arguing about it, we followed his lead and stumbled through that dark tunnel guided solely by instinct and trust in our instincts. As we shuffled forward into the darkness— Unable to see anything but shadows, 
I listened for any sign that the creature was pursuing us. The distant sound of its anguished screams pierced the eerie silence, but eventually faded away. After what felt like hours of trekking through this seemingly never-ending labyrinth, beams of sunlight finally burst through an opening above. With tired limbs and heavy breaths, we emerged from the subterranean maze and collapsed to the ground outside in relief. Upon catching our breaths and realizing our lives were no longer in imminent danger, we had many questions about this terrifying encounter with an otherworldly beast. However, none of us could come up with a rational explanation for the creature's existence. How could such a horrifying thing exist in our world? One assumption was that it could be the result of some twisted experiment gone awry, its creators abandoning it and leaving the monster to wallow in the depths of despair. Although we now knew about this hideous creature lurking beneath the earth, we couldn't contact the authorities because we had no idea whether they would believe our stories or if doing so would only bring more trouble upon us. We also quickly acknowledged that our wounded group member needed immediate medical attention, so we focused on getting him safely back to civilization as fast as possible. Talking among ourselves as we continued our journey back, we concluded that it would be best not to mention anything about the terrifying encounter down there and to let that nightmare remain buried deep down in forgotten caves. Once we were safe and back in town, I realized one thing while we all survived the incident physically unscathed, apart from the wounded man, all of us would carry emotional scars from that nightmarish day. The haunting yellow eyes staring at us from the darkness fetched a permanent reminder of how fragile our lives could be when faced with unimaginable horrors. As for any memory of those who were lost during our pursuit by the ravenous creature, they'd live on within each survivor's heart. I silently vowed never to let their memories fade away and to honor their bravery by sharing a lesson with others sometimes hiding away from an unfathomable horror may be the only way to ensure your survival. For years after that fateful encounter, my life continued on, but there was always a lingering fear of what may lurk beneath the surface. With every step I took, I remained ever cautious of unseen threats. I knew now that even in seemingly ordinary places, one could stumble upon nightmare-inducing creatures so horrifyingly real that they defy all reason and logic. I awoke under a brutally hot sun, grasping at crusted leaves as I struggled to regain consciousness. My name is Ronan Tsosi, and I am a police officer in the remote Navajo reservation deep within the deserts of Arizona. The last thing I remember was responding to an odd distress call from the nearby Red Mesa. So how did I end up at the base of this otherworldly rock formation? My fellow officers and I had been sent to investigate an abandoned car near the base of Red Mesa, and as we approached we discovered a trail of blood leading into the woods. We split into two teams, with my partner Lena Yazzi and me taking one trail while Officer Joseph Nanali followed another. The scent of hot pines inundated my nostrils as I stumbled in the same direction Lena and I had been following. Looking around me, breathing heavily, panic set in as I realized Lena was nowhere to be found. Continuing along the bloody trail on my own seemed risky, but it seemed like my only option. As dusk approached, shadows across the forest floor looked far too sinister for comfort. And then something noticed me, not human or animal but a monstrous creature that sent chills down my spine. Standing at least nine feet tall with muscled limbs protruding from its mangled torso, it had elongated claws that could surely tear a man apart. Unable to call for backup with my shattered radio equipment scattered on the ground before me, I had no choice but to hide within these dark woods that now felt like a prison. 
determined to find Lena alive but growing anxious about our situation on this alien terrain. Our rapport throughout our years on duty served as a reminder that if anyone could survive this otherworldly threat, she would be able to. In that dark forest where fear tugged at every step taken further from safety's embrace, it was our bond that kept me determined. Five hours I hid until the sun dipped below distant hills, casting a silver glow on this strange landscape. A distant howl echoed through the treetops and my heart stopped. Then, with renewed purpose, I ventured deeper into the woods, following the monstrosity's far-reaching cries. A guttural growl pierced the air. That creature was nearby. Navigating my way through tangled branches and dense foliage, I saw it, the beast gnawing on something left of a human form, which bore Lena's badge. My blood boiled, but survival depended on stealth. When it lumbered away with its terrifying gait, I tiptoed towards those remains, fearing what discoveries awaited under this harsh moonlight. It was Lena, face frozen in terror and clothes ripped to shreds. She had succumbed to this unspeakable horror, and rage intensified within me as sweat dripped from my brow. Her life demanded justice one that called to be met with forceful retribution blind to any sense of self-preservation. I circled back into darkness, planning revenge upon the murderer of both friend and protector of our Navajo people. Gathering materials from beneath ancient pine boughs in this hidden forest haven where men dare not tread required all my knowledge of Native American crafting handed down through generations. Using razor-sharp obsidian shards as quickly-hewn spears along with a customized bow crafted from fallen branches bent by relentless desert winds offered crude weapons in the face of unblemished evil stalking these lands unknown to all but its shadowy creators steeped in timeless tribal legend. With nothing more than these makeshift tools forged by desperation and sorrow's icy embrace plus a heart punctured by loss sharper than bitterest winter air chilled upon topmost peak-clad emissaries heralding impending doom nigh unquenchable within grieving souls' resigned embrace, I confronted the beast. On a moonlit era hidden under ancient Navajo legend's cold dark eyes, I stood before that unspeakable creature with furious intent clashing against lonesome sorrow and harmonious song composed through ancestral memories long seared into forgotten tongues. This was the one moment where destiny seemed both endless and fleeting, but it was mine to grasp before this monstrous entity could claim another victim. I scanned the area— searching for any signs of the creature that had taken Lena from us. Shadows played tricks on my vision as I ventured deeper into the forest. It was difficult to pinpoint where exactly the monster could be hiding, but I knew I couldn't alert it of my presence if I were to escape its grasp. My makeshift weapons were clutched tightly in my hands, offering me some semblance of protection. Through the trees, I noticed a figure standing still, almost blending in with the darkness itself. As I approached cautiously, the details of its appearance became clearer. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before, a grotesque mixture of man and animal, clothed in darkness and terror. Its long arms were equipped with claw-like structures, sharp enough to tear through flesh with ease. Its face was a horrifying concoction of familiar facial features distorted into something foreign and terrifying. My instincts told me to scream for help, but as I looked around and realized how deep into the forest I had gone, that option seemed futile. If anyone heard my cries for help, they would surely be putting themselves in danger by trying to reach me. I backed away slowly from the monstrous figure— hoping it had not noticed me yet. As if alerted by my footsteps, the creature turned towards me with a guttural growl that shook me to my core. In an instant, it lunged at me and began tearing apart everything in its path while making straight for me. With adrenaline pumping through my veins like a raging wildfire, 
I made the split-second decision to flee as quickly as possible through the trees. The forest offered me little protection as branches tore at my skin while I dodged and weaved in an attempt to separate myself from the pursuing beast. The creature roared behind me as it followed closely. Its heavy breathing was loud enough to shake loose pine needles and leaves above us. Though exhaustion threatened to overtake me and my muscles burned with fatigue, the thought of another person suffering Lena's fate fueled my determination to escape. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, I stumbled upon a small opening in the woods that led to the dirt road where my car was parked. I sprinted towards it, feeling as though my lungs would explode from the sheer exertion. I fumbled with my keys as the creature emerged from the forest, its eyes locked on me with hatred and bloodlust. In a final burst of adrenaline, I managed to open the door and start the engine just as the monster lunged for me one last time. The car roared to life, and I threw it into reverse before speeding away, leaving the creature screeching in frustration behind me. Pounding heartbeats competed with heaving breaths for my attention as I tried to gain control over myself while driving. Upon returning home, I researched every bit of information I could find about creatures that could have possibly been native to the area. My discoveries were not enough to fully identify what I had encountered. Instead, it left me with more questions than answers. How could something so malevolent exist in such a seemingly ordinary world? How many others had fallen victim? Over time, memories of Lena became distant but never faded completely. She served as a reminder. The gruesome actions caused by something beyond comprehension can never be forgotten. Even if I never found out what that creature was or if it was ever found or killed, one thing remains certain. We are never truly alone. My experience with that horrific beast shaped who I am today, a person who values every moment of life because we can never truly know how much longer we have. No matter what trial or tribulation may come our way, we must remember that even in our darkest hour, there is always hope. Sometimes all it takes is facing our fears head-on and emerging stronger than before. A chilling wind blew as I stood outside the barren gas station, located just off Navajo Nation land in Arizona. My name's Tahoma Keani, and after years of working in the city, I decided to visit my family on the reservation. Little did I know that my life would change dramatically. The attendant handed me the pump nozzle with a puzzled look. Hey, Tahoma! You heard about the three missing folks from down by the canyon? They ain't found em yet, and something doesn't seem right. I shook my head, uneasy with the news. My close-knit community usually kept track of all our members. Returning to my car, I heard rustling in the nearby woods and felt an instinctual shiver down my spine. Dinner with my family consisted of chattering about jobs, relationships, and local gossip. Casually mentioning the missing people sparked concern among them. My cousin Lahela shared stories about an old legend, a creature that preyed on those who ventured too far into its territory. One week later, I worked up the courage to explore the canyon where those folks had gone missing. Heavily armed and cautiously trekking through dense vegetation, I made it to an abandoned campsite. Tents were collapsed, clothes scattered around, but no trace of actual violence. Noticing an odd set of tracks nearby, I followed them towards a cave hidden by boulders. Peering inside, I saw scratched carvings telling tales of natives who encountered a fearsome beast generations ago, a description matching Lahela's legend. My hands tightened around my gun as shadows flickered within the cave's depths. Behind me came soft footfalls, turning quickly revealed glowing yellow eyes staring back at me. 
The monstrous apparition snarled menacingly, fur matted with filth and blood, an unholy mashup of animalistic features creating something new and terrifying. Paralyzed with dread, I managed a half-whispered plea. Please don't hurt me. You're not the one it wants. The voice was coarse and guttural, almost like the sound of wind through trees. It gestured towards the cave, now filled with echoing cries and anguished human wails. Panic-stricken, I retreated only to hear another whisper in the darkness. Return to your people. Warn them of their fate. Racing back to my relatives, I described every vivid detail of my encounter. My family members listened in horror, confirming that this creature was the same as La Hela's legend. United by fear, we formulated a plan. I urged my people to avoid the canyon, knowing that was where the creature hunted, laying traps wherever possible. Missing persons' cases continued, though at a slower rate, each one accompanied by an eerie growl echoing through the night. In an effort to confront the monster again, my cousins and I set out into the woods equipped with anything we could use as weapons. The creature had taken another victim from our community that day. As we neared its lair, fearful chattering among us ceased when screams from within the cave intensified, demanding our attention. With a deep breath, I led my cousins towards the infernal sounds within and braced ourselves for whatever lay ahead. We entered the cave. It stank of death and decay, the odor overpowering and revolting. The ground was slick with what appeared to be a mix of blood and some other viscous substance. We needed to act fast. My cousins suggested we should lure the creature out, hopefully trapping and capturing it alive. We have to get its attention, said my older cousin Mark, picking up a rock and throwing it into the darkness. We listened carefully, trying to gauge any movement in response. At first, there was nothing but silence. Yet soon enough, whimpering started welling up from the cave's depth, growing louder and more terrified with each passing moment. As we prepared ourselves for what might emerge, the whimpering turned into a full-blown scream. A figure staggered out, gasping for air. It was our missing neighbor, covered from head to toe in blood and bruises. As they ran toward us, we caught sight of the creature following closely behind. The creature was like none we had ever seen before, a monstrous hybrid of twisted limbs and matted fur, with razor-sharp claws at the end of each appendage. Its eyes were sickly yellow, and appeared to glow in the moonlight. I tried to call for help, but my voice caught in my throat as I stared at the horrifying beast. In contrast, Mark stood his ground and swung at it with his makeshift weapon, an iron rod he'd found earlier. But it swiped him away effortlessly with one powerful strike. This was our chance to escape while it was distracted, yet I would not allow myself to leave Mark behind. I mustered all my courage to approach the creature again, hoping to save my cousin before he met a cruel demise by this vicious beast's hands. As I raced against time to save him, my relative turned teammate, I could see Mark's eyes wide with terror as he lay there helpless, the creature's claws now ready to dig into his flesh. My adrenaline surged as I sprinted towards him, focusing only on his eyes, but just as I was about to reach for him, I felt something, a forceful shove from the side. One of my cousins had managed to tackle me out of the creature's range before it struck once more, and with a guttural roar, it bounded back into the shadows. My cousin mustered a thin smile before collapsing from exhaustion. I guess we made it out. We saved each other this time, but we couldn't extend that same mercy to those who had already fallen victim to this merciless monster. We managed to leave the cave, but not without scars, both physical and emotional, churning in our hearts. We mourned for Mark, whose valiance now lay in vain.
As days turned into weeks after that harrowing encounter, our community decided to seal off the canyon entirely. We tried not to dwell on the events of that horrible night or let their grisly memory consume us. There was no sense in allowing more misery when so much had already been inflicted upon us. One day, while rummaging through some old books and articles about nearby areas and their inhabitants, I stumbled upon something intriguing, a possible explanation for that nightmarish beast. In these records of local species and animal behavior research, it appeared someone had made an obscure notation about an unknown and rare animal. They referred to it only as the chimera. Though none of their descriptions matched exactly what we witnessed that night, and no one could discern its origins or true nature, little by little I pieced together what had happened. Our previously believed legend was actually an obscure reality very few people knew about. As time passed though we never forget what happened, we continued on with our lives. Sometimes during those quiet nights when the wind rustles through the trees, I swear I can almost hear the growl of that monstrous creature echoing through the canyon. We managed to survive, scarred forever by our experience, but always knowing deep down that somewhere not all too far away the truth was lurking. And maybe someday it would return again. I woke up to the alarm in my trailer, feeling groggy but with a sense of purpose. My name is Elon Sequoia, and I had recently returned to the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. As a native of the Oglala Lakota tribe, I decided to come back after years away and help the local police with cases on the reservation. My first assignment was simple, assist with an investigation into a missing person but nothing could have prepared me for what I would soon face. I headed out in my truck, turning down dusty roads that seemed eerily familiar. As I drove to the site where the last person had vanished, something felt wrong in my gut. The location was near a dense forest, with tall trees casting shadows even during the day. My fellow officer Lila Chayton, who had been in charge of this case since it began, waited for me there. She looked serious as we surveyed the scene, which didn't seem too unusual at first. What's been going on here? I asked. We've had several people go missing in this area over the past couple of months, Lila replied. It's like they just vanished without a trace. As we talked more about the case and shared some light jokes to ease the tension, we began hiking into the woods. The sun peeked through the branches above us, casting an eerie twilight-like atmosphere. With each step further into this dark realm, a creeping sense of dread grew stronger. The first clue we found was a torn piece of clothing snagged on a low tree branch. It belonged to one of the missing persons, Mel Hinto who had disappeared just two nights ago after leaving his job at a nearby convenience store. Guns drawn, Lila and I continued deeper into the forest until we reached a small clearing that showed signs of struggle. Broken branches and trampled grass marked it distinctly. It was here we encountered our villain. Despite still not knowing its name or true identity, it was a grotesque and hideous figure. The creature had long, Gangly limbs with sharp claws, capable of spearing its enemies with lightning speed. Its body was covered in a tar-like substance that made it almost impossible to see in the darkness that enveloped the forest. Suddenly, without warning, it struck. Lila fell to the ground with blood pooling around her from a gash in her arm. Panicking and unsure of how to react against this terrifying opponent, I couldn't think straight but my survival instincts kicked in. Gripping my gun firmly, I shot several rounds at the creature but missed each time. It was too fast. Lila screamed for help as the beast snatched her up, 
and began to withdraw back into the darkness of the woods. Unable to leave Lila at the mercy of this monster, I sprinted after them, adrenaline pumping through my veins. I stumbled over roots and rocks hidden under fallen leaves and nearly tripped several times but forged ahead, determined to save her life. My legs ached from sprinting so hard yet my pace only increased with renewed determination as I heard stifled cries from Lila echoing through the trees. Guided by these faint sounds, I pushed deeper into the now darkening forest. It was then that I stumbled upon a grotesque scene scattered remains of previous victims lay strewn about, providing chilling evidence that this monster had a taste for human flesh. The stomach-churning sight fueled my resolve to rescue Lila before she suffered the same fate. Fear gripped me as I continued through the dark forest, the crunch of leaves underfoot only increasing my desperate sense of urgency. I tried not to look at the dismembered remains of the creature's previous victims as I pursued the trail left behind. Tiny drops of blood shimmered on the damp ground, a telltale sign that Lila was still alive, for now. Without any options, I screamed into the darkness. Help! Someone, please! But the dense woods seemed to swallow up my voice entirely rendering me more isolated and helpless than before. The thick foliage also muffled any echoes, making it nearly impossible for anyone nearby to hear my frantic cries. Despair gripped me as I realized that no help would come in time. It was up to me and me alone to save Lila. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, I stumbled upon a clearing. Bloodied clothing lay discarded on the ground, and through my horror, I recognized them as Lila's. Determination took hold as I prepared myself for whatever awaited me in this sinister clearing. The faint sound of wet dragging reached my ears from deeper within the clearing. My grip tightened on the gun in my hands as I moved toward the noise. As I stepped out from behind a tree, I caught sight of that dreadful creature holding Lila's limp body in one elongated limb. Its spine-chilling stare bore into mine with hatred and hunger. Seeing Lila up close in this state spurred my anger further. Her injuries were severe, but she was still breathing. It became clear that she wouldn't survive this ordeal without immediate intervention. You're not taking her! I yelled, pointing my gun directly at the beast, finally remembering all those years spent at target practice. The creature simply tilted its head at me in terrifying silence before smirking in a way no human could mimic. It lunged at me, but this time, I was ready. I fired several shots at its center mass, making sure it couldn't dodge them like before. The bullets hit their mark. The creature's grotesque body shuddered and fell to the ground with a sickening thud. It twitched once before lying motionless finally defeated. Exhaustion crept over me as I quickly unhooked Lila from the sharp claws that had held her captive. Her eyes fluttered open, weakly acknowledging my presence as I dragged her safely away from the lifeless creature. Stay with me, I whispered urgently, choking back tears of relief and frustration. Hearing my voice seemed to bolster her own will to live, though losing blood rapidly, Lila kept her eyes locked on mine as we made our way through the woods. Despite her feeble state, she whispered hoarsely, Find help! As we emerged from the forest, shouting for help once again, passers-by on a nearby trail began running towards us, aiding and carrying both of us out of the woods while summoning medical professionals. While waiting for rescue in the hospital days later, we talked about what had happened in those dark hours. With no explanation or name for the monster that had preyed upon us and so many others, we could only surmise that it was some previously undiscovered species lurking in the vast expanse of wilderness. The gruesome conflict with that horrifying antagonist, whatever it was, left not only physical scars but mental anguish that would haunt us for years to come. 
Our experiences are now mingled with grief and sorrow for all those who fell victim to this monstrous entity before us. And yet gratitude reigns supreme. We know just how lucky we are to have escaped that forest alive. I woke up to a pounding headache, an unfortunate consequence of the botched celebration last night. I rubbed the sleep out of my eyes as my roommate Peter Thompson stumbled over the debris scattered across our living room floor. As a police officer stationed at our small Native American reservation, my life was usually uneventful. Tonight, however, would become an exception. Dragging myself to the window, I watched deer peacefully grazing in the twilight. Hearing Peter's shaky but determined voice, I turned to listen. Jared, he said nervously, something's wrong with Greg Armstrong's kid. What happened? I asked. He's been missing since last night. They found these markings in his backyard. We never saw anything like this before. Though skeptical, I could hear fear lacing his words. We set off in Peter's beat-up car to the nearby Uinta National Forest, where Greg lived. As we drove through the woods nearing Greg's house, we spotted traces of blood and torn clothing embroidered with bite marks. What had we stumbled upon? As we entered Greg's backyard, it became clear why everyone was alarmed some unnatural predator scorched its mark on the earth with three long scars diverging from a central point. Talking with Greg and his wife Evelyn, they told us how their son Jonah had gone out after sunset and hadn't returned home since then. Devastated and desperate for answers, I promised to help them find Jonah. Working with other local law enforcement officers and search dogs, we started combing the forest for any clues that might lead us to Jonah or whatever had taken him. We soon discovered another set of strange tracks precisely resembling those found in Greg's yard. It seemed this creature traveled throughout the forest leaving destruction in its wake. We continued trailing these prints until coming upon a clearing where signs of struggle were evident cracked branches lay on shattered ground surrounding a dense collection of human hair and tissue. Yet again, an unnerving set of tracks led away from the scene. My determination grew as we pressed on, following the trail deep into the forest. It wasn't long before we noticed chattering among the trees. Peering up, we saw a pack of killer ravens sitting menacingly on gnarled branches. At the base of a thick old oak, we found a nod human arm bearing a semblance to Jonah's sailor tattoo. Our initial shock was quickly replaced by resolve. We needed to find this creature and end its reign of terror. But daylight was our enemy as darkness began to envelop us, shrouding our surroundings in shadows. Fears spread through our group when we heard an inhuman growl not too far from our location it was time to make a decision. I signaled my team that it would be wise for us to split up. Anyone sensitive enough would stay behind, while the rest followed me towards the source of that sinister retreating sound. We moved cautiously forward when suddenly another deep growl echoed through the woods, this time directly behind us. Whirling around and pulling out my gun, I stared into the gloom unable to fully discern what awaited my line of fire. A member of my team screamed as something looming large descended upon him, claws shredding through flesh while fangs sunk into his jugular it was brutal. The creature momentarily revealed itself sharp talons protruding from its muscular limbs and jagged teeth dripping with blood illuminated by faint moonlight. The beast snarled at the sight of us before disappearing back into the darkness just as quickly as it came. Given how powerful this monster seemed to be, I made a split-second decision to take advantage of any potential weaknesses. The creature appeared disoriented by loud sounds so I raised my voice instructing everyone to make as much noise as possible. 
united in our determination, we yelled and banged on the trees, shoving this fiendish predator further back. As it retreated deeper into the forest, a grisly realization dawned upon me. On behalf of our community's safety, I needed to confront this fearsome creature despite the prevalent danger of such a task. Reflecting briefly on my peaceful upbringing on the reservation, I knew I couldn't let it continue threatening my people. I instructed the group to keep making noise while moving back towards our base camp. We had to warn the others what we encountered. The creature had already taken one of our team members, and we couldn't risk it targeting the rest of the community. As we made haste, the creature's growls and snarls followed us. Its presence was evident in every crackle of leaves and snap of twigs. Upon reaching the camp, I hurriedly explained what had happened to the remaining team members. The news of our lost comrade was met with a mix of shock, disbelief, and sorrow. Still, no one dared to question my actions. Our primary focus was on ensuring everyone's safety. I decided it was best for everyone to stay together in our makeshift barracks, taking turns keeping watch throughout the night. We fortified the entrances as best as we could and gathered anything that might serve as a weapon should it come to that. As night fell, tension enveloped us like a thick fog. The trees outside seemed to lean menacingly close to the structure, as if they were harboring hidden dangers. Every noise was amplified in our minds, an innocuous rustle transformed into a potential attack. We began discussing whether or not my attempted distraction had any lasting effect on the creature. Had our loud noises driven it away for good, or did it only deepen its resolve? Unfortunately, we found ourselves with more questions than answers. We briefly considered attempting to contact local authorities or even nearby hunting lodges for assistance and reinforcements. However, it became apparent that reaching out would expose our community's existence to outsiders, something we couldn't afford. Moreover, given the creature's swiftness and stealthy nature, there was little guarantee that any external help would even stand a chance against it. It wasn't long before another piercing scream disrupted our thoughts in an apocalyptic crescendo, one that echoed throughout the camp and sent shivers down our spines. People rushed to their feet, grabbing any weapons they had access to, while others seemed to stand frozen in place. The next sound snapped us back into reality and forced us to act, the crashing of wood outside the barracks. Our worst fear had materialized. The creature had found us. Without hesitation, those of us armed with weapons took fighting stances near the entrance and prepared for a vicious confrontation. But as we braced ourselves for battle, time seemed to slow down, and we began to lose track of what was real or imagined. Suddenly, there it was, its malicious eyes glaring back at us from the shadows, hunger for blood clearly written across its mangled face. Instinctively, weapons were raised in a joint effort to kill the creature, myself among them. The others clung tightly together and screamed once more. It lunged at us with such ferocity that gusts of wind followed in its wake. However, being outnumbered and faced with an equipped front before it proved an obstacle for even this seemingly immortal beast— we fought back harder than we ever had before, driven by determination and anger from losing one of our own, driving it out of the building. Together, we hounded it into the night under relentless pursuit. Some amongst us offered themselves as bait to draw its attention so those better equipped could deliver crushing blows. Finally, drenched in blood and sweat, our relentless onslaught forced it into retreat. As it disappeared into the dark abyss of night, we gasped for breath and took a moment to acknowledge our hard-won victory. Our terrorized community had managed to stand up against this sinister being and shown it what unity could accomplish. We never learned exactly what kind of creature had been plaguing us that fateful night, 
whether it was some mutated beast or simply an animal disturbed by nature's wrathful condition struck by survival instincts gone wild. But, as we resolved to never speak of it again, we silently vowed to remember our fallen comrade and the strength we found in one another. In the end, we knew that we'd be prepared for anything as long as we stood together. I stumbled upon the most unsettling discovery in the depths of Yakama Indian Reservation, Washington. My name's Nathaniel Cloud Whisper, a nature enthusiast, and my life changed forever after that day. While strolling along a tranquil path by the Ottenham Creek, I noticed unusual claw marks on the ground. I'm familiar with the wildlife around here, but this, this was different. The marks were deeper and more grotesque than anything I'd seen before. Continuing further, I came across Leona Hawksinger, our local ranger. Hey, Leona, I found some weird claw marks near the creek. Have you seen anything like them? She shook her head. No, I haven't noticed anything unusual lately. Identifying tracks proved futile. The odd markings piqued my curiosity even more. The next day, armed with my trusty camera and a sense of adventure, I ventured into the same region to get another look. The fresh morning dew sparkled the top blades of grass as the sun ascended in the horizon. Birds chimed merrily overhead, and squirrels executed acrobatic feats from tree to tree their cheerful actions juxtaposed against the ominous marks. My exploration led me to an alluring cave obscured by colossal pine trees. At first glance, it seemed like any other cave one might find in Yakama Indian Reservation. However, as I cautiously descended into its dark recesses, a distinct smell caught my attention, a pungent aroma mixed with decaying leaves and damp earth. A faint sound resonated from within the pitch-dark void, a combination of high-pitched shrieks and guttural growls that I couldn't reconcile with any known animal. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness of the cave, an indiscernible shadow moved rapidly within. My heart pounded against my chest as cold dread crept through me. A grotesque creature, unlike anything I've ever seen, stepped into the scant light. Its matted fur reeked of blood and filth, and its monstrous body bore multiple deformities. The creature's fangs hung from a gaping mouth while soulless eyes burned with malevolence. Paralyzed by unbearable terror, I scarcely noticed that someone else had come across this dreadful scene. It was Leona, looking unfazed by this abomination. What the hell is that, Nathaniel? she whispered. Before I could even mumble a reply, the grotesque beast lunged at us. Fighting against my paralysis, I grasped Leona's arm and bolted in the opposite direction. Through our sprint of panic and adrenaline, I screamed for help, but it was too late. We were deep within the reservation. Our lungs ached from each gasp of thin air as the unnatural creature stalked us relentlessly without any semblance of exhaustion. At one point, the villain gained on us and managed to swipe at Leona. Her scream echoed through the woods as blood streamed down her arm. We have to get back to civilization. I panted as we continued to run for our lives. Suddenly, Leona tripped and fell onto the rocky ground. Without hesitating, I turned back to help her up just as the malicious being descended upon us. I tried to lift Leona to her feet, but her injury slowed us down. The creature neared, its foul stench overwhelming our senses. Run, Nathaniel! Leona shouted. Get help! I hesitated, but she pushed me away, screaming with more determination. I sprinted, leaving her behind. My guilt weighed heavily as I ran toward the faint sounds of civilization. 
Finally, I stumbled upon a group of campers who had heard our screams. I explained our situation, breathless and panicked. They grabbed makeshift weapons, sticks, camping equipment, and cautiously followed me back into the cave's darkness. The beast was hunched over Leona's form when we returned. It turned to face us, blood dripping from its maw. The sight sickened and terrified me. We attacked the creature as best we could, however, it proved much stronger than anticipated. Amidst the chaos, another camper fell victim to its brutality. In that moment of confusion, one of the campers managed to land a solid hit on the creature's head with an iron pan from his camping gear. The beast recoiled but did not fall. Instead, it retreated further into the depths of the cave. Quickly realizing this was our chance to escape, we left the cave together, our screams having alerted park rangers who quickly arrived at the scene. Leona and other injured camper were rushed to the hospital while authorities launched a search for the perpetrator. But what they found in that cave was beyond their understanding, a group of deformed animals and carcasses, evidence of some twisted experiment gone wrong. The creature was never caught. Perhaps it was too cunning or simply knew when to stay hidden, leaving us with no closure on what happened that night in the cave. Injuries sustained by Leona and others healed over time. However, memories of that night continue to haunt us, a gruesome reminder of the horrors that lurk within the darkness. We can only guess at the creature's origin, some product of a vile experiment, or perhaps even a new, undiscovered species. But no clear answer can ever rid us of the chilling image of those bloodied fangs and soulless eyes. And while we may never know its true nature, we are forever burdened with the knowledge that this abomination still exists, lurking in the shadows and waiting for an opportunity to strike again. I couldn't believe what I saw. My heart raced, gasping for breath as I stumbled back. My name is Koena Nakai, a Navajo park ranger near Sequoia National Forest. My family had lived in this area for generations. Being familiar with every nook and cranny gave me great respect for the land, but now that respect was being tested. I had experienced strange occurrences before but chalked them up to nighttime noises or pranks played by locals. It didn't take much to frighten a ranger after dark. With only my truck and flashlight as company, I'd search for whoever was brave enough to horrify me, always coming up empty. On this particular evening, my partner and I got separated while investigating reports of a missing hiker. I'd agreed to drive around the reservation, stopping only when the radio crackled its coded commands. Suddenly, the trees loomed over me like giant apparitions, and an overwhelming silence filled the air. Hey! Koana! Can you hear me? The sound of Luna's voice over the walkie-talkie interrupted the eerie atmosphere. Yeah, I replied hesitantly, staring down at my boots as they crunched along the gravel path. I found something. You better come take a look. Her voice was strained. Following her directions, I reached a small clearing with Luna standing over a mangled corpse. The body was barely recognizable as if it had been eaten alive. What could have done this? Luna shook her head solemnly but didn't reply. We looked across the clearing at something that unsettled us deeply massive footprints each one larger than any animal we knew existed in these woods. Not wanting to stay near the body any longer than necessary, we chose to split up again. Luna would radio for backup while I followed the footprints in hopes of finding whoever, or whatever, was responsible. The tracks led deeper into the forest, revealing more gruesome surprises along the way. An overturned vehicle here, a discarded backpack there. 
Each new discovery sent shivers down my spine. But as I moved further in, a faintly glowing light ahead caught my attention. My senses were heightened. I could feel the tension in the air. Hesitant, I crept towards the source of the glow. A creature larger than any I'd ever seen before stared right back at me. Its ferocious gaze was unnerving. Its features were somehow familiar and bizarre all at once. Patches of coarse fur lined its grotesquely muscular body, and its enormous maw was caked in fresh blood. The creature knelt beside another mutilated corpse, clearly taken by surprise at my sudden appearance, but unfazed by the tragedy it had caused. My instincts screamed run, but my body refused. It scowled at me before lunging forward with frightening speed and power. The sheer force threw me back, and I scrambled to my feet as it pursued relentlessly. With its thunderous steps close behind and adrenaline rushing through my veins, it became a desperate race for survival. As we hurtled deeper into the woods together, sound resumed its hold on our surroundings. Luna's frightened voice pierced through the canopy. Alarms blared in urgency before being swallowed by their own echoes. Even amidst all this chaos, the fearsome chase continued. I felt my legs give out under me as we approached a steep ravine, gripping onto a stray branch for dear life while sliding down through dirt and debris. The creature's monstrous form towered above me as I frantically tried to find footing every moment bringing us closer to each other in this twisted game only one would leave alive. I thought of Luna, who had just called out my name. I knew I had to survive for her. We had planned a normal evening together but instead found ourselves face to face with this terrifying creature. Luna must have heard the commotion and started running towards me, unaware of the imminent danger she was putting herself in. The creature's claws swiped at me repeatedly, each miss a testament to its vicious intentions. I continued to scramble away, panicked by the creature's relentless pursuit. Luna! Don't come any closer! I yelled at her, hoping she would hear me over her own screams. I knew she wanted to help but couldn't risk her becoming another victim of this monstrous attacker. I was struggling to keep my balance along the steep edge of the ravine when the monster's heavy footsteps suddenly halted. I glanced back and saw it staring at something behind me, something that captured its attention more than the prospect of tearing into my flesh. A group of hikers appeared on the scene, armed with makeshift weapons. They must have heard our screams and decided to investigate the disturbance. The creature roared, baring its ruthless teeth. The hikers fought bravely, trying their best to fend off the beast, but it seemed that no human could stand against such force. Despite their courageous efforts, each hiker was quickly overwhelmed and torn apart by the creature's savage claws. I seized this opportunity to find a better hiding spot within the thick foliage. Safely concealed from view, I frantically tried calling 911 on my phone. My heart sank as I saw that there was no service in this remote wooded area. Calling for help wasn't an option. I knew I had to find Luna and get us both out of these deadly woods alive. As I made my shaky steps toward her distant voice, hoping the gruesome sounds of our rescuer's destruction were enough distraction for my escape, a thought occurred to me. Is this beast from some undiscovered species? Such a creature would be right at home in these remote woods, an apex predator that could tear through its prey with terrifying ease. Reuniting with Luna, I found her distraught but physically unharmed. We managed to get to our feet, and together we navigated the desolate landscape. Our physical exhaustion paled in comparison to our mental anguish, knowing that the monster could still be lurking nearby. We walked for what felt like hours before we finally spotted a clearing up ahead, signs of civilization offering us a glimmer of hope. Our resolve strengthened, and we pushed forward. 
As we crossed the final stretch of the dense forest into safety, I couldn't help but think about the brave souls who lost their lives trying to save ours. Their valiant efforts allowed us to escape that horrifying ordeal, and for that, they would never be forgotten. Our tormentor had seemingly not followed us out of its natural habitat. Perhaps it sensed that encroaching too close to human settlements would eventually lead to its own demise. In just a few short days, our quiet lives turned into blood-curdling nightmares. We were alive but forever marked by this gruesome experience. The fact remains that such an unknown creature exists in those very woods, hidden, dangerous, has left an ominous dark cloud over that previously serene area. Adventurers and explorers are now warned about the horrifying events that took place there, with several search parties sent out in hopes of uncovering the truth about this brutal monster. Some locals speculate that it is merely folklore brought frighteningly to life, a story told by elders and travelers alike to keep curiosity at bay. While others firmly believe that as humans encroach deeper into their territories worldwide, it was only a matter of time before they stumbled upon something truly otherworldly, a testament to the dark corners of our planet that remain a mystery to us all. Regardless of its origin, Luna and I would never forget the terror we faced that fateful day. We pay our respects to the fallen, knowing that their brave sacrifice not only saved us but alerted the world. Beware of what lurks in those woods, for they harbor unknown horrors capable of devastating destruction. I found myself in Oak Creek Canyon, Arizona, eager to embrace the serene nature surrounding me. Having grown up on a Navajo reservation, I'm no stranger to the beauty of my homeland. My name is Koenit Sosi, and to unwind from my daily grind as a mechanic, I often visit these woods. One evening while camping alone, I stumbled upon a unique and repulsive sight. This gruesome scene left me doubting my sanity. A trail of blood led to a mutilated deer leg dangling from a tree branch. The bone was snapped like a twig, and the flesh appeared to be torn apart by some ferocious force. Disturbed yet intrigued, I shared this encounter with my childhood friend Mariska Yazzie upon returning home. She listened with concern and curiosity wondering what kind of beast could do such a thing. Deciding to search for answers, Mariska and I began visiting Oak Creek Canyon regularly. As we ventured deeper into its heart, we would occasionally hear an eerie rustling or catch glimpses of an unsettling figure lurking in the shadows. The woods were alive with an unnerving energy that seemed to grow with each passing day. Upon discovering yet another blood-stained scene in the forest, we both noticed a creature observing us from afar. It stood upright on two legs yet had unmistakably animalistic features, claws jutting from its fingers and fur covering its misshapen body. Its hideous snarl betrayed an intelligence that would come to haunt us. Nearly immobilized by terror, we retreated slowly. Just as Mariska moved to call for help on her phone, we realized our predicament. There was no reception in this desolate area. Swallowing our fear, we planned our next move. On one particularly frigid night around our campfire, Mariska and I deliberated over our course of action as the embers crackled nearby. We mulled over the recent memory of a local man going missing and the police seeing no reason to involve themselves in yet another transient's absence. Our suspicions grew that the creature was responsible for these vanishing acts. The following morning, we carefully tracked the creature through the woods, moving stealthily to avoid drawing its attention. The closer we came to its lair, the more ominous our surroundings grew. As we crept through a shadowy thicket, we stumbled upon a cluster of bones. Each had been picked clean and appeared reminiscent of human remains, 
an unsettling revelation which only fueled our determination to expose this monster. We eventually arrived at a decrepit cave entrance hidden deep within the forest. Venturing inside, every sound amplified in our ears, screeching and echoing as if coming from all directions. We tightened our grips on our hunting firearms, aware of the weight they held in this fateful moment. Emerging into a cavernous space beyond the claustrophobic tunnel, we managed to snap photos of sinister markings scratched into stone walls. Just as we were about to leave this macabre den, Mariska suddenly whispered, Koana, look! Unbeknownst to us, the creature had been lying in wait. Its eyes gleamed with malice as it sprung towards us. I fired my shotgun in panic. Mariska followed suit with her revolver but slipped on wet ground before misfiring. The monster let out an ear-splitting howl and lunged towards Mariska. Paralyzed by adrenaline-fueled terror, I could do nothing as it grasped her limp body in its claws and began to tear into her flesh. As the creature mercilessly ripped Mariska apart, every instinct within me told me to flee. This was no time for heroics. I needed to focus on surviving and escaping this nightmare. I scrambled away, gunfire still echoing in the cave. Each step felt as though I were running through quicksand, my legs weighed down with horror and raw fear. Knowing that my life depended on my actions, I kept moving deeper into the cave. My only sliver of hope lay in finding another exit. Desperation gnawed at me as I stumbled upon a narrow tunnel branching off from the main cavern. As I shakily navigated its twists and turns, I occasionally glanced back, half expecting to see the creature closing in behind me. But there was nothing, only darkness stretching out in eerie silence. The tunnel finally came to an end at a small opening, barely perceptible against the dense vegetation outside. The weak sunlight streaming through offered a welcome contrast to the oppressive gloom of the cave. Mustering all my remaining strength, I pushed through the gap and squeezed my way out into the open air. I found myself gasping for breath, an unexpected sense of relief flooding over me as my eyes tried to adjust to daylight. It didn't last long. Painfully aware that time wasn't on my side, I began to run. The need for help never felt more pressing, if ever there were a time when it seemed appropriate to beg someone, anyone, for assistance, this was it. But luck wasn't on my side. My phone lay back in my discarded backpack within that hellish cave. Help! I screamed instead, hoping against reason that someone would hear me and come rushing forward. No one answered. I forced myself onward anywhere but towards that wretched place where Mariska met her gruesome fate. She deserved better, and glorious death at the hands of such a monstrous creature was a chilling reminder of our vulnerability and insignificance. As I trudged through the woods, I couldn't shake the image of that beast from my mind, its hideous, distorted face, crooked limbs like twisted branches, dried blood crusted around its cruel mouth. I wondered what manner of creature it could be, an unknown animal or something more sinister. A sharp, unnatural noise suddenly fractured the quiet. It sounded so much like the creature's earlier howls that my pulse accelerated. Was it following me? My mind raced with terrifying visions of what might happen if it caught up. Help! I yelled again, louder this time. Cruel irony in the fact that just when I needed help most urgently, there was not a single soul nearby to lend a hand. It felt like hours trudging through unfamiliar terrain until the forest finally gave way to civilization, a remote ranger station on the edge of the woods. The first flicker of hope ignited within me as I limped towards the simple wooden structure. Collapsing at their doorstep, I managed to choke out my story to rangers who stared at me in disbelief and horror. They radioed for help while one solemnly offered an apology for not being there sooner. 
We don't patrol that part of the reserve, he explained regretfully. Never had any reason to before. As he spoke, sorrow washed over me like an icy wave while images of Mariska racked with pain filled my mind's eye. As night fell and search parties combed the surrounding area for any trace of the creature, I huddled at the ranger station. Every creek or gust only heightened my terror that it hadn't had its fill of death and was ready for more carnage, this time seeking me out on familiar ground. In subsequent days, although no evidence of its presence beyond our photos was found, experts speculated over what it might be, an undiscovered species or a deformed mutation. But the truth remained as elusive as the creature itself and Mariska's death continued to haunt me. What was once unknown is now known as all too real. Gone is the illusion that humanity holds dominion over this world, replaced with the cold certainty that we are all just potential victims of something far worse than death, a terror lurking in the shadows, poised to pounce when we least expect it. I stumbled upon a gruesome sight near Pine Ridge, South Dakota, in the Black Hills National Forest. The body lay among the trees, torn apart as if by an animal, yet a sense of something more sinister lingered. My name is Jim Redsky, a member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Up until this moment, I prided myself on being a rational man and dismissed any stories about strange occurrences in these woods. As I inspected the scene further, I noticed unusual footprints leading away from the carnage. Curiosity getting the better of me against my better judgment, I followed them deeper into the woods. After miles of walking, I discovered an old, partially hidden entrance to Wounded Knee Cave, a place shrouded in my tribe's history and something we typically avoid. A feeling of foreboding washed over me as I hesitantly stepped inside. The cave walls seemed alive with shadows, and even though it was cool inside, beads of sweat dripped down my face. The whispers of ancient voices seemed to dance through the still air as I continued further into darkness. Gradually, I noticed faint noises ahead, screeching and grunting that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. A foul odor filled my nostrils as I moved silently towards the source. My heart pounded intensely in my chest. I hid behind a large rock and peeked around to see something. Unthinkable. A horrifying creature crouched over another lifeless body, tearing into its flesh with glee. It seemed part human, part animal combining aspects of a bear and a wolf. The eyes burned with an unnatural intelligence, making me certain that this abomination could not simply be attributed to any known wildlife. Fear paralyzed me for a moment before rationality kicked back in. There might be others who disappeared like this victim, possibly still alive, in need of help. I made it my mission to warn others, including the local police if need be, even if they didn't believe me. But I pondered, how could I do that without sufficient evidence? At that moment, the creature noticed me, its intense gaze almost looking straight into my soul. Terrified for my life, we stared at one another before my instincts took over, and I ran like hell. Lungs burning from running fast, I made it to a nearby occupied trailer. A man named Tony Holland answered the door, a short guy with shifty eyes who seemed surprised to see another person out there. Something horrible has attacked a man in the woods. I gasped between strained breaths. As fast as Tony could process my words, he already formulated a plan of action. We needed help from more capable individuals and weapons to face this beast. We decided to drive to the nearest radio tower, as cell service was scarce around these parts, to call for aid from local tribal police. While driving, we conversed about our families in an attempt to dissipate our rising terror. He'd lost his mother recently due to cancer and spent months managing her estate. As a single father myself, 
I understood how duty often overshadowed personal struggles. Despite our shared grief, we laughed about simpler times and discussed our present circumstances optimistically. When we reached the tower, Tony announced our predicament on an emergency frequency and requested immediate assistance while trying to avoid panic within his voice. We emphasized that we hadn't actually seen anything dangerous yet, but knew something was amiss. Let's hope someone actually lends us an ear. Tony sighed as we jumped back into his truck with trepidation growing at each passing second. Devotedly vigilant amid such harrowing circumstances, we both conceded. Whatever terrors haunted those woods warranted thorough investigation. In that spirit, Tony strapped on his hunting rifle while I revealed a revolver I called O.L. Reliable. Both our fathers passed on their firearms in times of duress, and tonight seemed dire enough. Suddenly, a scream tore through the black of night, one that sent shivers down our spines like ice water. We looked at each other with wide eyes. That sound was too close for comfort, emanating nearby. But time was running thin, and every minute we hesitated meant another possible victim snuffed out before their time. Armed and ready, we left the relative safety of the pickup truck to investigate. We ventured deeper into the woods, following the sound of the scream. Our weapons felt heavy in our hands as we prepared for whatever awaited us. We saw a trail of blood, and Tony hesitated briefly before pressing on, insisting we couldn't afford to waste time. The bloody trail led us to a clearing where we found a body torn apart, its limbs scattered across the ground. The gruesome sight was horrifying, but neither of us could look away. The body belonged to a man we knew, one of our neighbors, Charles. He had often walked his dog in those woods, and now he met a grisly end. Tony gulped and mustered his courage as he spoke into the radio once more. We found Charles dead, he stammered. There's some kind of creature out here. Backup is needed immediately. Seconds turned to minutes as we waited for a response, but none came. We stared at each other worriedly in the eerie silence. Fear bubbled up inside me as I realized that we were alone with this unknown threat. As I tried my best not to think about Charles's mangled body, Tony whispered that he heard something rustling in the bushes nearby. We strained our ears, listening for any sign of movement. Our heart rates spiked as we caught sight of a large figure emerging from the shadows. The creature was nearly seven feet tall with long arms ending in sharp claws. Its skin was covered in coarse fur that blended into the darkness surrounding it. The beast had brightly glowing eyes that fixated on us with an unnerving intensity. Without saying a word, Tony fired off a shot from his rifle at the creature. It recoiled from the impact but didn't go down. Instead, it charged straight at us and raged. Panicking, I fired my revolver at it too. This only seemed to make the beast angrier and more determined to reach us. We broke into a sprint, trying in vain to outrun it. The creature pursued us with an unnatural speed, its claws tearing through trees as if they were made of paper. As we neared the safety of the truck, our hearts sank to see it had been torn apart. The creature must have done this while we investigated the scream. We turned back to the woods, and my heart raced even more when I realized Tony was no longer by my side. I shouted his name into the night but received no response. He must have been taken or killed by the creature. I knew I needed to find shelter, and soon, stumbling into a nearby cabin, I barricaded myself inside as best as I could. I took deep breaths, trying to steady my shaking hands while clutching my revolver. The creature prowled around outside, waiting for me to make a mistake. What felt like hours passed as sweat poured down my face and my every muscle felt like it would snap with tension. But eventually, the sounds of movement outside faded away, replaced by silence. As dawn broke, I cautiously emerged from the cabin. The nightmare seemed over for now. I searched in vain for Tony's body, or any sign of him, but found none. After making it back home safely, 
I reported everything that happened to local authorities. They listened with disbelief etched on their faces, but sent men out to search the area nonetheless. They found nothing except for Charles's remains and indications that a large animal had stalked us in our desperate escape from the woods and then disappeared without a trace. For days on end, they searched and studied until coming across information about a cryptid, a bear-like creature known only through whispers and rumors that matched its description perfectly, tall and covered in coarse fur with glowing eyes. How this cryptid wound up in our small town's surroundings remains an enigma even now. While Tony's body was never found, and the creature was never seen again, the memory of that fateful night remains with me. No laughter or smiles I had while reminiscing about family on that drive with Tony can erase the shocking reality of the true terror that awaited us in those woods. I stay away from them now and tell others to do the same. But when I close my eyes, I can still see those glowing orbs bearing down on me in the darkness, and the gruesome image of that torn-apart body lying under a moonlit sky. I can only try to forget the horrors of that awful night. I stumbled upon the scene at the edge of the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. My name is Luda Redwing, a Native American living not far from the Wounded Knee Creek. The sun cast eerie shadows over the desolate landscape. I was a nature enthusiast who enjoyed long walks to clear my mind. During this trek, I witnessed something that changed my life forever. As I approached a dense thicket, I noticed mutilated branches scattered on the ground. The area emanated a strange and foul odor, causing me to cover my nose. Cautiously proceeding, I discovered remains human remains, disfigured beyond recognition. A chill ran down my spine as I realized that this person had died a gruesome death. Horrified, I had never seen anything like it before in my years walking through these woods. I knelt for closer inspection and saw tracks leading away from the body. The footprints were unlike any animal or human tracks I had ever seen, clawed, large, and with an odd gait pattern that suggested a bipedal creature. Driven by curiosity and fear, I decided to follow them, hoping to unveil the mystery of this unknown monster. The deeper into the woods I went, the more unnatural it all seemed twisted branches, broken trees, and an unsettling silence that pervaded the air. Before long, I encountered Kiluda fast horse struggling to catch his breath near a fallen log. Did you see what happened here? he asked frantically. I found a body, I replied with hesitation. We agreed to continue deeper together in hopes of finding answers while trying to keep our wits about us. As we delved further into the darkness of the forest discussing what kind of terrifying ordeal awaited us, we tried breaking the tension with light-hearted banter and humor. Not too far away from where we found him, we began hearing eerie noises that sent shivers down our spines. A guttural growl echoed around us making the hairs on the back of our necks stand up. We exchanged nervous glances but held our ground. Suddenly, a massive beast-like figure burst from the bushes, charging straight for us. I felt my heart pound in terror as my eyes scanned the monstrous creature coming at us. It was over seven feet tall, covered in matted black fur with long sinewy arms that ended in razor-sharp claws. Its legs were thick and strong like tree trunks, built to run with ease. Its head was elongated and filled with rows of sharp, gnashing teeth, and its eyes burned red like hot coals. Kiluda instinctively swung his hiking pole at it as we frantically tried to fight off the monster. Despite our efforts, it snatched him by the arm with a grip iron-like and dragged him deeper into the forest as his screams grew fainter. I sprinted after them, determined to save Kiluda from whatever grisly fate this creature had in store for him. 
As I pursued them through dense foliage, staggering roots and grinding leaves made it impossible to keep up with their pace. Before long, I found myself surrounded by other frightened people from the reservation. Together we formed a party set on rescuing Kiluda and putting an end to this nightmare. Led by Shola Rollins, we drew upon our collective knowledge of the land with steely determination. While others joined us carrying guns, knives, and flashlights, outsmarting whatever fate awaited them took precedence. Cautiously advancing toward where I last saw them vanish into darkness while hunting for unbiased clues in hopes of determining the mysterious perpetrator's true identity without stirring unseen fears or suspicions. Finally locating Kiluta left horrifically battered near an ancient creek and mourning inevitable community loss amplified ineffable shock overpowering each one of us. As adrenaline surged through our veins in anticipation of unspeakable impending confrontation against an unidentifiable enemy, the beast materialized behind us. Hairs prickled, hearts raced and time appeared to slow down as those around me aimed their firearms at it. Fast approaching the creature's towering figure without a second thought of self-preservation, shooting wildly and cursing with palpable fear. Bullets ricocheted off the gnarled tree trunks, but our efforts seemed futile. The creature had thick, matted fur that seemingly absorbed everything we threw at it. Its size was enormous, standing on two legs like a man but with twisted limbs and elongated claws on its massive hands. Its features resembled a bear in some ways but distorted and grotesque. As though sensing our frustration— the monstrous creature lunged for Shola. I tackled her out of harm's way, bracing for impact when it missed and smashed into a tree instead. We had no other choice but to run. Everyone, retreat to the village! Shola shouted as she scrambled to her feet. We didn't have to be told twice. The creature let out a bellow that shook the very earth beneath us. As we attempted our escape, it seemed to know its territory better than we did. It caught up easily, effortlessly tearing through anyone unfortunate enough to be within its reach. In a split second, I turned to my left only to see it rip one of our friends apart as he helplessly screamed. Taking advantage of its momentary distraction with its new prey, we quickened our pace towards the village. It wasn't long before the sounds of terror subsided behind us. Was it too much to hope that we'd escaped? My heart pounded in my ears as I suddenly became aware of the sickening reality that more lives had been snuffed out during our flight. We need help, Shola gasped as we reached the village. There's no way we can take down this thing ourselves. Our group split up, each person knocking on as many doors as possible. Strength lay in numbers now, especially if anybody who could make a difference was still alive. Soon, the entire village gathered in haste and prepared themselves, fearing for their own lives and those of their friends taken by this terrifying creature. Elderly members shared accounts of old stories that frightened children in the past but were never actually believed, telling of a being not entirely unlike the one now terrorizing us. Still panting from the rendezvous, I managed to convince a few brave souls to accompany me back to where Kiluta lay, leaving the remaining villagers to devise strategies and call upon neighboring communities for any aid. Thankfully, we discovered Kiluta still clinging to life as we cautiously approached his location near the ancient creek. The others who were not as fortunate lay around him innocent victims of the vicious abomination that was still very much at large. We carried Kiluda back to the village where a distressed doctor feverishly attended to him amidst the chaos. Meanwhile, our community rallied with renewed determination and grim purpose. No more lives would be taken by this unknown nightmare. As dusk approached and our numbers grew stronger with each new arrival from nearby settlements, our community engaged in a final, decisive confrontation with the beast. 
no longer able to catch us off guard and unprepared, we began turning the tide against it as many of us managed well-executed shots and even managed to wound it. Underestimating its endurance proved nearly fatal. It persevered despite considerable blood loss. Out of options, I grabbed a large metal spike lying in someone's workshop and plunged it deep into those grotesque limbs that had previously taken so many. Our combined efforts paid off as a final barrage drove it, dead or dying, far from our village's borders. Night was upon us when silence finally fell like a blanket over our victory. We said our heartfelt goodbyes to fallen comrades and locked up remaining weapons for an uncertain future. But through this terrible ordeal, our people had faced down fear and destroyed an unimaginable enemy together. And no question still lingered regarding what kind of creature had wrought such devastation upon us, whether truly bear, man, or something else entirely. One thing was absolutely certain— the horrendous nightmare that had crept into our lives unbidden was now ended. I wiped the sweat from my brow, squinting at the vast expanse of forest that surrounded my Native American reservation. My name is Takoda Nayeli, not a common name, but it suited me. I have lived on this land for all my life, and today I'd planned to take a hike in the Cascade Mountains, Washington State. I never expected what would unfold during that hike. I took one last sip of water from my bottle before continuing deeper into the dense canopy. The Cascade Mountains were beautiful and serene, providing a perfect backdrop for my hiking adventure. Hey, Takoda! One of my friends shouted as he caught up with me. We exchanged a friendly grin, recognizing each other from our work on the reservation firefighting crew. Hey, Zenko! How's your day going? I asked casually. Not bad, he replied, taking a drag from his cigarette. Think about joining the firefighting team? It's pretty intense. We continued our conversation as we hiked deeper, unaware that soon we would witness something that would change our lives forever. We stumbled across a gruesome sight, human remains scattered around an ancient burnt tree stump. The shock left us both staggered. We couldn't help but feel horrified and intrigued at the same time, wondering what could have caused such carnage. Before we could even contemplate calling for help, an eerie silence settled over us. I felt an unnerving presence lurking in the shadows just beyond our vision. Suddenly, from behind us emerged an enormous creature none of us had seen before nor heard about its existence. It resembled a wolf but was much larger and more terrifying than any wolf I had ever seen. Its fur was mottled with shades of black and gray, and its eyes glowed like burning embers. We froze in terror as the creature studied us with unsettling intelligence before turning away and disappearing back into the darkness of the woods. We tried calling for help, but the dense forest swallowed our cries, leaving us feeling isolated and helpless. This journey that began as a simple hike had now escalated into something far more dangerous. As fear and adrenaline coursed through our veins— we realized there was nobody to help us. We had to face this monster on our own. Knowing it was futile to run, we chose to stand our ground. We brandished whatever weapons we could find, makeshift clubs made from fallen branches and sharp rocks that peppered the forest floor. Then, without warning, the creature lunged at us with terrifying speed. I felt its teeth sink into my arm hot pain flaring with each heartbeat. Zanko swung the club in a desperate attempt to save me from the beast's grip. We fought for what felt like an eternity, matching every move with all the strength we could muster. Narrowly avoiding a swipe of its lethal claws, I picked up a jagged stone and drove it deep into one of its glowing eyes, 
It howled in agony, an ear-piercing sound that would haunt me forever. Suddenly distracted by a familiar voice calling out for help somewhere in the distance, the creature hesitated. Seizing this opportunity, Zanko shouted a joke about its horrid appearance while I threw another rock at its wounded eye. And just like that, a seemingly endless battle came to an unexpected pause. The ferocious beast retreated back into the shadows. In the midst of the chaos, we tried to call for help again. But our voices were no match for the sounds of the thick forest. The creature's retreat was temporary, and we knew it would return with a vengeance. After catching our breath, we exchanged a few hushed words. We decided it was time to leave this godforsaken forest and find our way back to civilization. The possibility of rescue seemed remote, and it was up to us to make our escape. As we slowly inched through the dense foliage, we heard the creature approaching from behind. Panic set in, and we found ourselves running blindly through the forest, cracking branches underfoot stumbling over roots hidden beneath decomposing leaves, and gasping for air as if it were being squeezed out of our lungs. Out of nowhere, a ranger appeared on an ATV. He had been searching for us since hearing about our misadventure from some other hikers who had come across our abandoned backpacks earlier in the day. The creature charged at us once more but paused momentarily as it set its sights on the ranger. It sensed fresh prey, a more formidable opponent than two tired hikers. The ranger brandished his gun and unloaded several shots into the creature's abdomen. It screeched in agony and dropped to the ground, motionless. We clambered onto the ATV, our bodies shaking from exhaustion and fear as we left the dead monster behind. In that moment, all rational thought was stripped away by a primal instinct to survive. We knew nothing about this beast, its origins or even if there might be more lurking nearby. While making our escape, I caught my reflection in one of the ATV's side mirrors. Matted hair, dirt-spattered face, bruises adorning every exposed surface like gruesome reminders of what had happened here today. Upon reaching safety outside the forest's boundary line, police officers greeted us. The search for us had expanded into a full-scale rescue operation. They took our statements, but their expressions made it clear that they had difficulty believing our harrowing encounter with the creature. It was hard to fault them. It was all so unbelievable. Meanwhile, a team of wildlife experts and police officers ventured back into the forest to investigate the area and retrieve the creature's body. While we would never find out much about their findings, we heard whispers among them that this creature might be something entirely new. Some speculated it could be a mutated apex predator driven from its original habitat by deforestation or construction. We left town soon after, too shaken to stay near the place where we had nearly lost our lives. Zanko and I exchanged few words for the rest of the trip. There was no need. We had both lived through it and knew that neither time nor distance could entirely erase those memories. However, I took solace in one thought. We had survived, and our story would serve as a warning to others. The forest once seen as an escape from reality and a place of serenity, hid dangers beyond comprehension. In the end, our lives went on. Sanko moved to another city, finding solace and anonymity. I returned home to my job, but no matter how far away from that forest I went or how long it had been since it happened, the scars remained as proof of what transpired there. Over time, Stories circulated about other beings similar to the one we encountered in that forest, creatures lurking in the shadows of remote areas. It became a cautionary tale shared by campers sitting around their late-night fires, urging everyone to tread lightly on nature's doorstep. The creature's body remains a mystery, 
whether hidden deep within a government laboratory or lost in nature's endless cycle to be reborn again someday in another form. Yet its memory lingers like an indisputable reminder of the vast and often unknown world we coexist within. Thus, as I go about my daily life, I am ever mindful of what might be lurking just beyond the edge of my perception, unseen but undeniably real. And in that knowledge, I find an odd sense of comfort. Whatever the creature may have been that day, it was unmistakably part of this intricate, mysterious world that surrounds us. I stumbled upon a peculiar scene, walking through the dense Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. My name is Nawel Santos, and I work as a park ranger at this majestic forest that houses my people's ancestral lands. I never expected an ordinary day to become something so blood-curdling. The sunlight flickered through the trees as I followed a barely their trail, surveying the land and recording any changes in flora or fauna. A gut-wrenching stench overtook me. I discovered a lifeless body, a hiker, by the looks of it, his torn clothes drenched in crimson. But there was something far more unsettling. His limbs appeared twisted beyond the limits of human comprehension. Beads of sweat formed on my brow, but I managed to calm my racing heart and dialed for backup. The signal was weak. I couldn't get through. Confusion swept over me. Was this an animal attack or something else entirely? I yearned for support, yet all agents were occupied with search and rescue missions after recent storms flooded our campsites. I decided to investigate myself. The overwhelming stench led me deeper into the forest, making my eyes water and my gut twist in knots. The deteriorating beam of sunlight was gradually replaced with shadows stretching across the forest floor like cold fingers reaching out to grasp my ankles. Beneath a gnarled old oak tree, something caught my attention, claw marks. These marks were unlike anything I had ever seen in these woods, massive and cruel. As panic welled up within me, I realized that no animal within our ecosystem could have created those sinister imprints. Heaving a sigh of relief that at least it wasn't one of our indigenous creatures causing havoc, my nightmare evoked thoughts of wendigos and skinwalkers, myths my grandfather often spoke of around our family campfires. Pressing on warily, morbid curiosity and concern for fellow hikers drove me to confront whatever lay ahead be it man or beast. The sun disappeared completely, casting the forest into an eerie twilight that played tricks on my eyes. The scent of rust and decay intensified, becoming almost unbearable. Suddenly, I heard laughter, strange and distorted, ricocheting through the trees like a sentient echo. Peering deeper into the darkness, I saw a figure emerging from the shrubbery, hunched and grotesque. Its mottled flesh hung off protruding ribs, and the grotesquerie intensified as my gaze met two deep-set eyes above its gaping maw, a ghastly admixture of human and animal. It cackled maniacally. For a moment life stood still, as though nature itself recoiled from this hideous being. Instinct compelled me to flee, but my feet wouldn't register commands. They betrayed me. Shaken by this terrifying encounter with the creature responsible for mutilating an innocent hiker, I quickly recalled where I left the body earlier. The decision came near instantly. I needed to find weapons to protect myself and others before trying to get an emergency message out of these cursed woods. A faint rustling in the foliage jolted me from my thoughts. Licorice black tendrils seemed to stretch from the thick brush reaching towards me with agonizing slowness like the tentacles of some underwater leviathan. My heart thundered in my chest as I stared at these sinewy appendages, just as frightening and grotesque as their grisly owner. As the tendrils crept closer, 
I knew that attempting to fight or confront this monster was futile. My only hope was to run and find help before it captured or killed me. Gaining control over my trembling legs, I forced myself to continue running while ignoring the pain coursing through my limbs. I sprinted towards a nearby clearing, hoping to find civilization, a road, anything that might lead me to safety. Instead, I found a small cabin, barely visible behind the dense foliage. Without hesitation, I hurried inside and locked the door behind me. The fear that gripped me prevented thoughts of calling for help on my cell phone. It was as if some primal force within me understood that if I drew attention to myself, the creature would surely find me. So instead of making a call for help, I awkwardly slumped against the wall near the locked door and ear pressed against the cold wood and listened intently for any signs of the creature outside. Several agonizing hours went by in painful silence as I strained to listen for any sounds from outside. As dawn approached and the first light sluiced through the small cracks in the walls and windows, a fleeting sense of courage ignited within my chest. I couldn't stay hidden in this cabin forever. I needed help. Moving cautiously towards one of the windows, I peered out into the world beyond. The trees seemed to be standing sentinel around the cabin, tall and foreboding but seemingly clear of danger. Feeling slightly emboldened by what appeared to be an empty forest scape, I made up my mind to find help. Opening the cabin door with a deep breath and nerves singing with adrenaline-induced tension, I searched for any signs of civilization or people with whom I could share my horrifying experience, anyone who would listen and believe my story. Their attention called to another part of the woods where a group of campers huddled together, exchanging anxious glances. They hadn't seen the creature firsthand but the unsettling atmosphere and energy in the area were palpable. Feeling compelled to warn them, I scrambled toward them as they stared at me with looks of confusion and fear. Get out of here! I shouted, explaining that the forest was not safe and that there was a creature lurking in the depths of the woods. Luckily, they heeded my desperate warnings. Together we fled from the scene, driven by terror and an instinct for survival. As we went, however, I allowed myself one last look into the darkness, catching a glimpse of those sickeningly twisted tendrils retreating back into the shadows. Days later, feeling slightly more at ease with people around me, our ordeal made headlines locally and beyond. We were questioned by authorities and curious minds alike my description of the monstrous creature causing even more furor. Despite scientists' best efforts to identify this unknown beast based on my description, it was all for naught as no known species matched my account. The somber realization that this creature remained unidentified only fueled the nightmares haunting me each night. Thus resolved my encounter with this monster, its kind unknown even to this day. Our impossibility to understand it or prevent its future atrocities weighs heavy on me as I bide my time before sleep shatters what fragile peace I can regain in remembrance of that horrifying ordeal in the woods. I found myself on the edge of the reservation, the autumn wind biting through my clothes and chilling me to the bone. My name is Aloysius to Hawks, and I was called upon to once more return to my ancestral lands to help search for a missing person, one of our own. Elders spoke of troubled spirits, but I never believed those tales. As a police officer in Rapid City, South Dakota, I knew the disappearing acts were likely practical in nature. That night— I went alone to visit Red Cloud Creek. The stream gurgled softly and spread the bitter scent of decaying leaves. Goosebumps climbed up my skin, but not because of any ghost tale. I spotted indistinct tracks near the muddied water. Whatever made them wasn't human. Pressing onward, 
I wandered farther from the path than anticipated. After what seemed like hours walking in circles, undergrowth snapped behind me. Spinning around, I found Jackson Columbia, friend, fellow officer, and search party member. I just saw those prints too. He whispered hoarsely, eyes wide. As we moved along the creek's bank and deep into reservation territory, we started to find other tracks which didn't belong to any creature we'd seen before. They grew larger and more distinct with each step deeper into darkness. In time, all that connected us with the outside world was a faint glow from our flashlights. That's when we stumbled upon something that churned my stomach. Bloodied tendrils of cloth clung to tangled branches while crimson stains marred every surface. Someone was attacked here. Jackson murmured as my flashlight swept over a gouge in rugged bark as jagged as broken glass. This tree had not been hit by an axe or gun. Suddenly we heard an animalistic growl reverberating through the trees around us. Instincts screamed at us to flee. We stood back to back, our hearts pounding like anvils our guns trembling in our hands. Why didn't we bring the others? Jackson asked, voice quivering. Back up, we should have called for backup. The creature lashed out, unimaginable pain blinded sight and thought. I screamed in sheer agony while squeezing the trigger of my gun, desperate to fight back. No! Jackson, hold your fire! I begged choking on blood as a sharp metal taste filled my mouth. From the darkness emerged an unnatural beast, a living nightmare that defied reason. It stood on cloven hooves over nine feet tall, its fur matted with gore and grime. Horns twisted like smoke above slitted eyes that glinted like green embers. Fangs dripped with saliva as the animal snorted and stamped its hoof in the dirt. It charged towards us relentlessly, its furious growls echoing off gnarled trees that twisted in warped angles. Panic won as my fingers stabbed repeatedly at my electric lantern switch that refused to illuminate anything but my own shaking hand. We grappled with our fear when suddenly, both clips of our guns clicked empty. Knowing I was defenseless against such a beast, my legs moved on their own accord and bolted from the forest path behind me. Jackson followed closely in terror. Galloping hooves slammed against the wet earth as the beast barreled through underbrush to chase us down. Sweat mixed with tears as I pushed myself faster than I ever imagined possible before finally clambering over a fence that bordered sacred burial grounds near Pine Ridge's limits. Screeching came from every direction until it abruptly ceased. We'd lost track of it. Breathing heavily while laying on damp grass behind that wooden fence— I whispered to myself one word, Yinald Lishiai, Skinwalker. What do we do now? We can't just leave our people in danger. Jackson whimpered into the frigid air. We will end this. I whispered, blood staining my jacket darker as resolve steeled my spine. Together, we will face this horror. As agony threatened to pull me under its dark embrace— Whispers amongst the breeze foretold a path that had never been there before. The call for help had been answered, but at what cost? With a great force of will, I forced myself to stand up and face the nightmare before us. I locked eyes with Jackson, who nodded in agreement. It was time to put an end to the terror that had plagued Pine Ridge. We decided to contact the local authorities for help. After explaining our situation, we were told that they would send a few officers to investigate the area and that we should remain in our homes until further notice. The gravity of our situation weighed on us, but we knew deep within ourselves that this couldn't continue any longer. The next day arrived, and the police visited us first thing in the morning. After taking our statements, they ventured into the forest where we had encountered the beast— armed with powerful weapons and a steely determination to put an end to this threat once and for all. Jackson and I stayed at home that day, consumed by anxiety, as we awaited news from the officers. As evening approached, we finally received a phone call from them. They had found evidence of a large creature stalking through the woods, 
but had been unable to track it down. Before going back out for another search attempt in the morning, they advised us to stay indoors and lock our doors. Feeling somewhat disheartened but resolute, we knew we couldn't just sit around waiting while our friends, families, and neighbors were in danger from this monster. We made a plan. Jackson would search online for any information on similar incidents or reports of such a creature while I put in calls to friends around town who might have seen or heard anything. As night fell, we delved deep into databases and forums online trying to uncover information about similar creatures encountered around Pine Ridge or anywhere else in the world. It became evident that finding valuable information wasn't easy. Some reports were utterly fantastical, while others seemed far too simplistic to account for what we had experienced. Meanwhile, my friends were all equally in the dark with none of them having any encounters or information regarding the beast. As midnight approached, we started to feel like we were running out of options. The fear once again crept through us as we considered the inevitable truth. Perhaps there was no help to be found in our search. Defeated, Jackson and I decided to eat a quiet dinner and try our best to find some rest. That night, we slept fitfully plagued by nightmares and bouts of checking every window and door numerous times. Despite the exhaustion weighing us down, we knew that giving in wasn't an option. We had to continue pushing forward. The following morning, after little sleep, Jackson shared some information he had found deep within a local online forum discussing sightings around Pine Ridge. Apparently, the creature had been sighted stalking near an abandoned house just outside town. Though it was a long shot, it was a lead that we couldn't pass up. We informed the officers about our discovery before they set out for another search, emphasizing that this could be their best chance at finding the monster. They agreed it was worth investigating and thanked us for our perseverance. Determined to see this through to the end, we waited nervously for updates while following news outlets for any reports of sightings or confrontations. Time marched by as if in slow motion, but finally, we received a call from the officers. They had discovered the lair of the beast within the abandoned house's cellar. Piles of bones and remnants of its past victims littered the floor like macabre decorations. In their pursuit, they managed to drive off the creature into dense woods far from Pine Ridge's limits. While they had not been able to capture or kill it, they assured us this creature would think twice before coming back. Though it felt like a small victory given its escape, the town slowly returned to normalcy as more time passed between sightings or confrontations. People eventually stopped waiting in fear for some new violent occurrence to take place. The authorities continued keeping a close watch on the area, ensuring that Pine Ridge's residents would not suffer at the hands of this beast again. Although we came out on the other side, I could never shake the haunting memory of the monster. The terror it instilled remains etched deeply into my mind. While it may still roam out there in some far-off wood or darkest corner, one thing remains true. Pine Ridge, and our people, survived its reign of terror. I stepped out of my pickup, my boots crunching on the gravel in front of the Mazinop Police Station on Moraine Lake Road. My name's Lon Otto Willow and I'm here to question Chief Spencer Quinn about a hunting trip that went terribly wrong, nearly claiming his life. As a professional detective and a native Ojibwe, I have had my fair share of encounters with bizarre cases. Inspector Foxtail said you'd be coming, Detective Willow, said Chief Quinn as I entered the small cramped office that smelled of tobacco smoke. I noticed a sense of unease in his voice as he shifted uncomfortably in his chair. I sat down and prompted him to tell me about his encounter. He cleared his throat, speaking hesitantly at first but gradually gaining momentum as he recalled the traumatic event. We were hunting along Black Pine Ridge when we stumbled across something we shouldn't have, began Chief Quinn. 
His hands trembled as he took another puff of his cigarette. We found a hiker, Viv Bull Fox, he continued. Poor chap was ripped apart, barely alive. He paused for a moment to catch his breath. We didn't know what to make of it. Bear attacks aren't unheard of here, but this was on another level. The room grew cold as he recounted their chilling discovery. Not far from where we found Viv, there were these massive footprints, just like nothing we've ever seen before. As the story unfolded, I could see fear rise up in Chief Quinn's eyes. We heard rustling in the bushes behind us, thought it was a lost hiker or something. He swallowed hard before continuing. Then this creature appeared from nowhere, huge thing with long claws and fangs bared in the moonlight. It snarled as it stalked towards us. At this point, Chief Quinn's face was pale and beads of sweat tripped from his brow. We opened fire, not sure if we hit it, but it retreated. He shook his head. Few days later, we found Viv dead in his bed. His wife, gone. The gruesome details made my skin crawl, but I had to know more. I needed to find this creature that haunted the reservation's woods. I knew my ancestors would be proud of me for protecting our land and people. Recruiting a tracker named Amadahi Thompson and an officer named Arvid Greyfeather, we set off into the woods armed with rifles and knives, prepared for whatever lay ahead. We followed the trail of footprints deep into the heart of the forest, leading to a cave hidden among the trees and rocks. Inside, we could smell the stench of rotting flesh and death. Amadahi bravely entered first, lighting up our surroundings with her flashlight. In horror, we discovered scattered bones and body parts belonging to several victims, each one torn apart in different ways, but no sign of Viv's wife or the terrifying creature Chief Quinn had described. Still on edge, we pressed further into the cave until we reached its depths where countless bones adorned the walls. There stood a massive figure, shrouded in darkness at first before Amadahi's flashlight revealed its horrifying form. Unnaturally tall with leathery hide stretched over rippling muscles, it towered over us like an ancient beast from forgotten legends. It snarled and swiped at Arvid, sending him crashing to the cold cave floor covered in blood. Amadahi desperately fired her rifle as I drew forth my Ojibwe knife-resisting instincts to call for help as there was little chance anyone would reach us down here in time. I yelled out a war cry as I charged at the monster, knowing there could only be one outcome. Somebody would surely die. Amadahi continued to fire her rifle at the monstrous creature while I tried to face it with my Ojibwe knife. The sound of bullets echoed in the narrow cave, but they seemed to have little effect on the beast as it merely grunted and bared its teeth at us. It turned towards me, its muscles tense and ready to strike. Call for help! I yelled desperately at Amadahi, hoping she would be able to reach someone before it was too late. Arvid's injured. We're not going to make it out of here on our own. She shot me a quick look of determination before pulling out a two-way radio from her pocket. Chief Quinn, she shouted into the device. We need backup. Arvid's hurt, and we're cornered by something in the cave. Her hands shook as she darted quick glances between the radio and the creature that moved closer with each passing second. I could see her struggle to maintain composure as her eyes widened in fear. The beast lunged forward with one swift motion, claws slashing through the air. Dodging them barely by inches, I held up my knife, willing myself not to falter under its heart-stopping gaze. Amada he managed to connect with Chief Quinn on the other end of the line. Just hold on. We're coming to help you. He assured us with a firm confidence that seemed impossible given our circumstances. We fought to keep the monstrous creature at bay, 
Amadahi using up her limited ammo creatively while I used my trusty knife to maintain some distance between us and those deadly claws. Minutes felt like hours as we held our ground, hoping that rescue would come soon. Eventually, however, we could hear shouting echoing down the cave Chief Quinn was arriving with reinforcements. The creature's once powerful movements faltered as it registered more people entering the chamber. In that moment, I saw a small opportunity for us to escape its clutches, and we seized it without hesitation. The team of officers helped the severely injured Arvid up, supporting his weight. We all carefully backed away from the creature, weapons still aimed at it in case it decided to spring on us again. Once we reached the entrance of the cave, an officer shouted urgently, Ignite it! Burn this place down! At his command, another officer took out flares from a backpack and tossed them into the depths of the cave. The fire caught quickly, lighting up the damp walls as flames destroyed everything they touched. As we watched the blaze consume the creature's home, my thoughts were with those unfortunate souls who had perished within its tavern, Viv's wife among them. I couldn't fathom what nightmare they suffered before their lives came to such a grisly end. Chief Quinn thanked Amadahi and me for our brave efforts stating we had done our best to protect our people. He asked me if I knew what that creature was. I shook my head, having never encountered anything like it before. Its hideous form would haunt my memories for years to come. With Arvid alive but gravely injured, he would face a long road to recovery. Amadahi blamed herself for not being able to protect him better during the confrontation. However, she had resisted letting fear take control, avowing herself to ensuring nothing like that ever threatened our people again. As healing began in the aftermath, both physical and emotional, one thing was certain, that horrifying beast was now without a den and would eventually have to search for a new home far away from here. No one could predict if it would ever return or what other terrors of nature lay hidden within our world. But we would do our part, faced with unknown horrors and tragedies, to keep our land and people safe. I will always remember that fateful day in the cave, the horrendous creature, those we lost, and our refusal to surrender to fear. I woke up at dawn, rubbing my eyes as I glanced out of the window. The sky was an explosion of orange and pink, casting a warm glow on my surroundings. My name is Nialt Sosi, and I overheard a strange conversation while heading to work, something about a creature in the woods near Redwood National Forest. The thought sent shivers down my spine, making me question whether I should investigate. Why would they joke about something like this? I muttered, stepping outside into the biting cold. A sudden gust of wind blew through my tangled mane as I wandered deeper into Redwood National Forest. My breath visible, I grew increasingly uneasy. The stench of death hung in the air. It was at that moment that I decided to look for help. Hey! I shouted to a man who seemed familiar, someone from around town. Do you know what's going on in these woods? The man... Sani Nez nodded, his face etched with worry. People are disappearing. Turns out it's not just hearsay, he revealed as we ventured further. We found ourselves in an area eerily still and silent, a stark contrast to the rest of the lush forest. Suddenly, something caught the corner of my eye, something lurking in the shadows. My pulse quickened as I leaned closer but before I could fully process what lay before me, a terrifying growl thundered through the tense atmosphere. The creature stalked out from its hiding place. It was unlike any animal we had ever seen before, flesh hanging from its bones, hair matted with what looked like old blood stains. 
Its long razor-sharp teeth gleamed menacingly as it bared them at us. Fiery red eyes burned with malevolence. Both Sani and I stood paralyzed by fear until we heard another growl, this one even more guttural than before. It echoed loudly, forcing us to take a step back, hearts hammering in our chests. We have to leave, Sani whispered urgently, his face pale. I nodded quickly, realizing that if we wanted to survive, it was time to make our escape. As we turned away from the looming threat, ready to sprint for safety, another blood-curdling roar echoed through the forest. The creature began stalking closer to us, knowing we stood no chance against it. What do we do? I whispered shakily to Sani. Fight or die, he responded in a hushed voice. Eyes darting around wildly, I noticed an abandoned car nearby. Sani, throw me a distraction now. He grabbed a handful of rocks and started pelting the creature in quick succession. The strategy seemed to work. It briefly diverted the monstrous beast's attention from us. We took advantage of its confusion and bolted towards the car. My heart pounded in my chest as I fumbled with the door handle. Sani took the wheel while I searched for anything useful in the glove compartment. Luck favored us when my hand grasped the cold metal of a loaded handgun. We barreled down the rough forest path at breakneck speed, adrenaline coursed through my veins as we made our daring escape from that nightmare-inducing creature nipping at our heels. We continued to drive through the dark forest, hoping that we had left the creature behind. I could see Sani's knuckles turning white on the steering wheel. We knew we had to find help as we weren't equipped to deal with the monster, but we were miles away from the nearest town. Suddenly, I remembered my cell phone in my pocket. I quickly grabbed it and tried calling for help, but there was no signal. My frustration boiled over, and I desperately looked around, searching for any sign of civilization. As if in response, up ahead, Sani spotted a small cabin with smoke coming from its chimney. It was our only hope for shelter and perhaps assistance. As we pulled into the driveway, we both noticed that our surroundings were eerily quiet no sounds of birds or insects filled the air. We knocked on the door of the cabin cautiously, hoping someone inside could help us. To our relief, an older man greeted us warily. What do you want? he asked gruffly. We need your help, Sani explained. There's something out there in the woods a creature. The man's eyes widened slightly before he narrowed them suspiciously. You kids playing a prank? No, I said firmly. This thing attacked us. It chased us through the forest. He studied our panicked faces and seemed to know we were telling the truth. Reluctantly, he allowed us inside his cabin and offered us water. What did this creature look like? He asked as he sat across from us. It was huge, Sani began. Its body was covered in fur or scales. It was hard to see clearly, and it had these terrifying sharp claws. Each limb seemed longer than what would be natural for an animal. The old man leaned back, mulling over our description. He told us that he'd been living in this area for many years and that he'd seen strange things happen in the woods. You should leave as soon as possible, he warned. That creature gets bolder and more violent with each passing year. It has attacked people before. His urgency sent chills down our spines, and we realized that this horror was most likely no tall tale. This man had encountered or was aware of this monstrous being for some time. We asked him about contacting the authorities, but he told us that the reception was always terrible in these woods, and the town was hours away by foot. As daylight seeped through the curtains, we frantically discussed our escape plan. The old man agreed to lead us back to town on foot. He knew shortcuts that would help us avoid crossing paths with the monster lurking in the woods. 
With our hearts pounding in anticipation, we set out determinately. Despite our fear, we couldn't shake our fascination with the creature's origins what kind of animal could it be. Had it been a mutation or something entirely new? We kept these thoughts to ourselves as we marched forward, desperately avoiding anything paranormal. The journey was grueling, but eventually, we reached the town safely. We showed our gratitude to the man who saved our lives before parting ways, each intending to forget about this terrifying ordeal. Undoubtedly, this experience would haunt us forever. Despite not knowing exactly what had been stalking us in those woods and never seeking answers when we were finally safe from its grasp, one thing was clear. There are things in this world defying expectation and logic creatures that remain hidden from society's gaze. We had unwittingly stumbled upon such a horror during those dark moments in the woods. More than anything else, it taught us that even if not all secrets are within reach of human understanding or explanation, they do exist, and sometimes they can come dangerously close. As I returned home to my mundane life far from the small town, I couldn't shake the chilling shudders that enveloped me the realization that it's not just our world out there but something much more sinister and hidden. So we live our lives with caution, knowing that there are things that remain undiscovered and unexplained, hoping we never cross paths with another creature like it again. I leaned against my truck, taking a sip of lukewarm coffee from my thermos before setting out on my usual patrol. My name is Victor Talchief, and I'm a security officer for my tribe's reservation in the heart of Washington State. I'm no stranger to the woods and bizarre occurrences that sometimes happen out here, but nothing could have prepared me for the terror that would unfold. I knew every twisted path and gnarled tree like the back of my hand. It was a serene day as I walked with soft steps on the carpet of leaves, humming a tune to myself. There was stillness in the air that was comforting yet unsettling all at once, a feeling that I couldn't quite put my finger on. As I ventured deeper into the woods, I noticed an odd pattern of tracks etched into the damp earth. They were large, clawed prints unlike any animal common to our lands. The discovery piqued my interest and with quiet determination, I decided to follow them. Soon, I stumbled upon an eerie scene. A small encampment marred by chaos with overturned tents and scattered belongings told a grim story. Anxiety began to churn in my stomach as I approached to investigate further around the site. Hello? A cracked voice called out weakly as my focus shifted toward a trembling woman who appeared from behind one of the disheveled tents. Her clothes were torn and blood stained her tattered appearance. I quickly radioed for assistance while trying to comfort her, though my experience was mainly with wildlife encounters, not human ones. What happened here? I asked as calmly as possible. It, it came out of nowhere. She whispered through evident pain while clutching her injured arm tightly. It was big and fast. Her words spoke of fear and dread which mirrored my own emotions. The air thickened as we awaited help, each minute dragging like hours clocked by onerous ticks. Upon our helper's arrival, they transported the woman to safety while I continued my initial investigation. There were more tracks leading in the opposite direction which urged me to pursue them. Thoughts raced about the unknown creature that had inflicted harm upon the woman and disrupted an ordinary camping trip. I followed the prince to a clearing, where the late afternoon sun played tricks with shadows amidst tree trunks. As I stood sentinel, waiting and watching, my tension slowly gave way to frustration. Then, a low growl resonated from behind, sending chills down my spine. I spun around only to find myself face to face with the snarling nightmare of a creature a monstrous amalgamation of beast and man with razor-sharp claws and feral teeth bared menacingly. My heart drummed wildly as we shared the clearing. 
Time seemed pause. A silent standoff commenced filled with unspoken threats and mutual wariness. The creature suddenly lunged at me, claws slashing through the air as I narrowly dodged its assault. Adrenaline surged within me as I scrambled to stay alive. Thoughts of my family members and loved ones fueled my resolve to prevail against this supernatural foe encroaching upon our tribal lands, grievously endangering anyone it encountered. Reaching a momentary reprieve between attacks, I managed to unsheathe my hunting knife from its leather casing on my belt. The gleaming blade now held with tight conviction, ready for anything. My knife held firmly in hand, the creature observed me for a moment, its animalistic senses seemingly gauging my level of threat. As if deciding that I was still prey to be consumed, it lunged once more. In defense, I swiped with my hunting knife, managing to cut along its arm. The creature halted for a moment, assessing the wound. Blood oozed from the gash on its forearm. But strangely enough, it made no sound, no growls of pain or anger. Instead it stared at me more intently. I backed away slowly, attempting to create a distance between us without sudden moves that may trigger another strike from the beast. My heart thundered in my chest as I formulated a plan to survive this encounter. Help! Someone help! I shouted into the surrounding area but was met with silence. It seemed that calling for help was pointless. The woods stretched far around, and it was unlikely anyone would trek in this direction any time soon. To top it off, with each step backward I took, it retaliated by advancing closer eyed me hungrily. I decided to begin circling the clearing when I noticed my foot growing dangerously close to a thick tangle of roots and tendrils growing along the wooded floor. A plan formed in my mind. If I could guide the creature near these roots while avoiding them myself, maybe I could take advantage of its hesitance to expose its wounds any further. Each step of our dance, my retreat and the monster's approach— brought us closer to the makeshift trap I had conspired. As we neared it finally seized the opportunity, leveraging its shocking speed as claws raked through the air towards me. I sidestepped quickly, narrowly avoiding its pounce and running directly towards the waiting roots where I hoped the creature would be snared momentarily. As fate would have it, all went according to plan. The creature, pushed by its momentum, became entangled in the vines and roots that had served as my trap. The fear in its eyes was palpable as I approached it cautiously, knowing full well that even trapped, this creature still possessed a deadly prowess. Who were you? I whispered to the beast, which, despite its fearsome appearance, seemed to comprehend my question. In its eyes, deep within the feral intent and rage— I caught a glimmer of what appeared to be intelligence, a human-like semblance of understanding. But the moment quickly faded, and again it struggled violently against the vines. With no time to spare and unwilling to take any more chances, I brought my blade upon the creature one final time. Blood spilled onto the forest floor, and with a choked gurgle it fell limp, never to menace another soul again. My breath was heavy as I surveyed the results of our battle. Though victorious, my hands were doused in the eerie blood of this strange creature whose true nature I would never truly understand. Limping back towards our camp and checking my wounds along the way nothing too severe thankfully thoughts about them raced through my mind. The woman who needed saving earlier, was she stalked by this same being? Had we been on borrowed time all along? Once back at the campsite, seeing fellow tribe members threatened throughout our ordeal brought me both relief but also concern, their fate now seemingly too intertwined with whatever unknown horrors lay hidden within these ancient forests. I couldn't rid myself of that singular glance where reason might have flickered within that beast, an innate wisdom in its eyes that seemed almost human while being anything but. The truth behind these woods felt aflame with shadows— spiraling locks of darkness melting into deeper pools of ink-black secrets waiting for their chance to spread further outwards into our world. But for now, it was over. Though blood-stained and weary, 
I had protected my family and our land this day. A dull pain in my temple refused to go away. I dragged myself out of bed, cursing the inevitable hangover that seemed to worsen with age. At thirty-eight years old, I hadn't anticipated that moving back to my childhood home on the Navajo reservation would spiral me into an endless loop of headaches and exhaustion. I missed the city life, but after my divorce from Sarah, it felt like the right time for a change. That change led me back here, keeping me sane. My name is Patai Yazi, and after working as a detective in Phoenix for over a decade, coming back to my roots felt like finding solace in familiar territory. My best friend Lise was already here, a deputy at the local station. In some ways, we were more than friends. Our fates aligned ever since that fateful day during our childhood when we both escaped an unimaginable horror deep within Pueblo Creek Canyon, a place we vowed to never return. I headed out for work, knowing that the recent reports of missing persons weighed heavily on Lise and me. At work, passing by various officers discussing their own cases and leads, Lise looked solemn yet focused. Have you heard about another missing person? Apparently it's Kara Littlefoot's nephew she said with concern. Kara Littlefoot was known around town as an eccentric woman with a penchant for assisting law enforcement in solving cases using traditional Navajo beliefs and rituals. We made our way toward Kara's house to learn more about her nephew's mysterious disappearance. Underscore Antiabihi underscore Destiny Eater, Kara murmured as we entered her modest abode. She stared at us wide-eyed, convinced that something unnatural was happening in this town. She went on to explain that underscore and tiabihi underscore was a creature that eluded identification and thrived on human suffering. It had been years since the last known appearance, but it was always loomed over our town like an unspoken secret. I tried to shake off my unease, wondering why Kara's nephew hadn't simply called for help. Back in our time... Kids went off into the woods and only came back when they had a compelling story to tell. You didn't call for help because that risked losing your credibility, she said. Despite my skepticism, my experience as a detective compelled me to follow up. Returning to Pueblo Creek Canyon and questioning my instincts, I wondered if that lurking terror from our childhood was once again stalking our lives. Leading the search party, we combed the dense woods with plague determination. Soon enough, we stumbled upon a gruesome sight blood splattered upon rocks, shredded clothing clinging to thorny bushes. I studied the scene closely, knowing the traces of a sinister presence when I saw them. The creature seemed both calculated and savage, leaving behind an unnerving air of dread among us all. As night drew closer and convincing ourselves that this was all just circumstantial evidence of animal predation, we heard distant cries echoing throughout the canyon. Instinctively fanning out in search of help, for ourselves or for Kara's nephew, I couldn't help but notice Lee seemed rooted in her spot. Why aren't you calling for help? I asked through gritted teeth. What if it's trying to lure us deeper into its lair? She whispered. The look on her face confirmed what I couldn't bring myself to fully accept. There was more going on than natural phenomena and animal instinct. Continuing onward through the dark and oppressive forest, each branch snapping underfoot resonated like a gunshot in the enveloping silence. With each passing second, our trepidation grew heavier like a shadowy smoke suffocating us ever tighter with every step we took further into its heartless realm. Cursed presence lurking around the corner. We could feel it waiting for the perfect moment to strike like lightning in the sunless sky. Turning a corner, we were met with an abomination wearing the remnants of its victim's clothing, drying, discolored human organs dangling from every extremity, teeth gnashing and saliva dripping down its putrid maw. Standing proudly over its latest prize obscured by dark leaves and blood, it turned to face us. Its eyes were a piercing yellow that seemed to glow in the darkness, 
making it impossible for us to look away. As it approached us, the creature barely made any noise. Its body seemed perfectly designed for stalking prey in silence. Its nails were long and sharp, curving like daggers eager for our flesh. The realization that we were facing something outside of our realm of understanding hit us all hard. We had no idea how to call for help without getting ourselves in even more danger. In that moment, every decision felt like a gamble. Lise pointed a trembling finger at the animal parts hanging from the tree behind the creature. Are those, were those used to, lure Kara's nephew? As I stared at the grisly scene, an unsettling thought crossed my mind. Perhaps this monster would soon add our entrails to its twisted display. The notion pushed me to act despite feeling paralyzed by the sheer terror I was experiencing. Gathering my courage with strained vocal cords, I yelled, Kara! Get your nephew and run! I hoped she was close enough to hear me, but not close enough that she too would be caught by this ruthless devil. The creature turned its head sharply towards where I screamed, sensing another possible prey. Seizing this opportunity, Lys and I darted deeper into the forest avoiding notice from our hellish foe. It seemed we managed to steer it off course temporarily while still attempting our own escape. Our hearts raced as we plunged further and further into the woods, knowing a single misstep on roots or rocks could jeopardize our lives. We found ourselves running along what looked like an old path obscured by bramble and debris. Time was an enigmatic force as each frantic step guided us deeper into this menacing wilderness. Suddenly we stumbled upon a clearing where tall trees gave way to a vast emptiness stained with moonlight. Relinquishing hope of finding any familiar territory, we caught our breaths hoping it might be safe to assess our predicament. Our frantic breathing echoed through the dense woodlands around us, obscuring any sounds that the monster might be coming for us. Exhausted and covered in sweat, Lise and I started building a makeshift hiding place using large branches and foliage found nearby. Our only hope was to lie low and wait for daylight so we could see this nightmare clearly enough to strategize our next move. Truthfully, we never thought we'd end up victimized by the very nightmare we hoped to end for Kara and her family. Though without any devices to measure time, dawn seemed just moments away as darkness faded around us. We built a shelter out of twigs ample enough to hide our shivering selves in fearful anticipation. Thankfully, daybreak was upon us and our vigilance held steadfast. The creature was nowhere in sight. With renewed confidence now that daylight was on our side, we decided to make our way back to Kara and her nephew under the cover of morning sun. We crept along carefully but with purpose knowing every second that passed left them vulnerable. Once reunited with Kara and her nephew, who thankfully were unharmed in their hideout, I couldn't look away from the tearful embrace as they held each other tight. In those precious seconds, I considered how lucky we were that they survived this terrifying ordeal unscathed while pitying those who had crossed paths with this creature previously. Leading them back to civilization with caution guiding every step, we vowed never again to venture into the dark unknown. While we would never forget how close we came to death at the hands of such an unimaginable beast, our story fueled the fierce determination to ensure others wouldn't suffer a similar fate. Despite knowing there must be more like it lurking in the shadows, a logically rationalized hunter stalking prey, the four of us patrolled territories, warning unwitting wanderers of gruesome dangers hidden among nature. Though time has now weathered our fear and memories into stories shared among murmurs and whispers, one legacy remains. The monster that was once just a part of our nightmares has now become a myth defining the wilderness where it resides striking a fierce need to defend against its continued existence. For us, the survivors of a brush with death at the hands of an unthinkable evil, it seems only fitting that we denied the beast its nightmarish prize, leaving nothing for the creature but empty vengeance as we share our blood-curdling story through generations.
I stumbled upon the shallow grave while exploring the Appalachian foothills surrounding Cucumber Gap Trail in Tennessee after a long hike. For a second, I almost mistook it for a rugged indentation in the soil, but the fractured skull fragments peeking through the dirt screamed otherwise. I'm Kai Lilal, an ordinary guy who grew up on a Native American reservation in Cherokee Territory. During my days off, I'd venture into the forest to appreciate nature and escape the daily grind. Backing away so as not to disturb what was now an active crime scene, panic bubbled in my chest as I glanced around for any signs of life human or otherwise. But there was no one around, and cell reception was erratic at best. As luck would have it, I couldn't call for help that instant. My eyes scanned nervously for any identifying marks on the trees to help me find this spot again. With each step back to civilization, my mind raced with possibilities. Who would commit such a heinous act in this peaceful idol? And why here? Eventually, reaching an area with decent reception, I dialed 911 and reported the gruesome discovery. Days later, after statements had been made and police tape enveloped our small rural town, whispers of an ominous legend began to reemerge. Something about an ancient creature that hunted these grounds decades prior suddenly felt relevant again something which was whispered about with fear but never taken seriously. I often discussed these whispers with my good friend Ella Sanders over a meal at Roy's Café. We shared jokes about how our ancestors might laugh at us for being more baffled by their legends than their own challenges faced centuries ago. But one day when Ella came to see me her eyes wide with shock laughter was far from our minds. The victim, it was Danny Arbor. She choked out, struggling to find words that didn't come easily. Danny was not just some transient or faceless person from my childhood. He was someone I had grown up with, exceeded token limit. And suddenly the stakes felt far more personal. Rumors and side-eyed glances now filled the air in our community. The legend of a creature residing in these forests grew louder, while tales implicating this nightmarish antagonist as guilty of murder. Of course, I doubted its existence until that fateful late afternoon hike. Ella had insisted on exploring the woods again, determined to find any clues the police might have missed. There, in the dimly lit forest so familiar to us both, we stumbled upon what appeared to be strange markings on a tree trunk. Curiosity pushed me forward while caution held Ella close behind. Then we heard something that made my skin crawl, an eerie mix of growl and guttural laughter that seemed to vibrate through the trees. That's when I saw it a creature from our darkest nightmares. Enormous but hunched on all fours, it had filthy matted fur and claws like sickles dripping with gore. Its eyes were soulless pits of blackness that zeroed in on us. I stood frozen, my mind racing, trying to comprehend the abomination before us. For a moment, Ella and I stared into the creature's void-like eyes before our instincts took over. Run! I shouted, and we both sprinted in the opposite direction. The creature roared and gave chase, its guttural laughter echoing through the forest. We ran faster than we had ever run before, desperately avoiding jagged rocks and exposed roots in our path. I could hear the creature's heavy breathing and pounding footsteps just behind us. Help! Ella cried out as we tore through the woods hoping someone might hear us. But I knew it was futile. No one ever ventured this far into the forest. The adrenaline coursed through me as we pushed our bodies to their limits. We briefly darted behind a large boulder for a moment of respite. What is that thing? Ella gasped between breaths. I don't know, I replied. But we need to get out of here. As we continued running... I hoped that perhaps we could tire the creature or outrun it long enough for it to lose interest. Up ahead, 
I spotted an abandoned cabin with a sturdy-looking door. It wasn't an ideal hiding place, but it might offer some temporary protection. Ella, head for that cabin, I said, pointing in its direction. We dashed towards it with renewed energy and managed to quickly dive inside before slamming the door shut behind us. The creature's horrible laughter continued as it slammed against the door several times before eventually stopping. The deafening silence settled over us like a cold mist. Had it finally given up? A few days went by in agonizing fear and anxiety. Ella and I were too wary and exhausted even to consider sleep or eating during that time. The thought of leaving was tempting but dangerous. Was waiting better than risking another encounter with the creature? When we finally mustered the courage to crack the door open and venture outside, the creature was nowhere in sight. We quickly retraced our steps through the forest, the memory of that horrifying chase still burning in our minds. Upon arriving back at our small town, we were met with sympathy and curiosity. We now looked like shells of our former selves, our faces worn from sheer terror. I approached the town's veterinarian for answers. If anyone could identify this strange creature, it would be him. After a detailed description of the creature and its grotesque features, it became apparent that no known animal matched its description. It seemed like we had encountered something entirely new, or perhaps undiscovered until now. With no other way of making sense of our experience, we couldn't help but entertain the idea that this monstrous being was behind Danny Arbor's demise. The terror that we faced in those woods will forever haunt us both, a gruesome reminder of just how dangerous dwelling in folklore can be. Ella and I mourn Danny every day and hope that others in our community would learn from our horrifying encounter and avoid venturing into those same woods which hid such a bestial creature. As time has passed, I've come to accept that we may never know what exactly pursued us that day or if it still lurks within the depths of those shadows. The thought of revisiting those woods terrifies me more than anything else, because although Ella and I survived that fateful encounter— it remains uncertain if anyone else will be fortunate enough to live through such an encounter with that vile beast. However, despite my uncertainty about what lies in those woods, one thing remains painfully clear. Ella and I won't ever forget Danny Arbor nor the terror we faced as prey to an unknown monstrosity. And perhaps the hardest part is knowing that there is still so much more we still cannot understand hidden dangers lurking within nature's untamed grasp, waiting for their chance to strike. I woke up startled by the sound of branches snapping beyond the window of my modest home. My name is Tahoma Nokosi and I've lived here in the woods near the Okafinoki National Wildlife Refuge my entire life. It was just an ordinary day spent fishing for catfish in the peaceful swamp, but something felt different this time around. Tahoma! What was that noise? My friend Anacona asked, with a hint of concern. I shrugged it off, not wanting to alarm him. Probably just deer roaming around. I replied, sipping water from a dirty glass. Later that evening, I reached out to Ayana Apeniman, a local elder and spiritual leader in our community. A deep feeling gnawed at me that I couldn't put into words, a thought that there was something more sinister in those woods than we wanted to acknowledge. You must listen closely, Tahoma, she advised me. Pay attention to every sound and movement. That night, I sat outside and observed. In between occasional gusts of wind rustling the leaves above me, an eerie silence enveloped my senses. The twilight sky dimmed into darkness as I tried to find peace in the quietness that had overtaken the surroundings. Soon after midnight, as my eyelids started growing heavy, I heard another snapping twig, 
this time much too close. Placing my hand on my hunting rifle for security, I caught a glimpse of a figure moving in the trees, or rather, what seemed like shadows twisted into the shape of a living creature. It's true, Anakona whispered in sudden realization. The elders warned us about such threats lurking around these parts. Fear gripped my heart, and instinct took over. The figure darted towards us through the shadows faster than anything we'd ever seen before. We scrambled inside the house and bolted shut every door and window, but I knew deep down it was only a matter of time before this creature decided to break in. As the minutes of terror ticked away, I attempted to recall the elders' stories of similar occurrences to determine how local folks dealt with these creatures in the past. In Jinga, was that the name they'd mentioned? The thought scrambled through my mind, but I didn't recognize any name from the myths. Uncle Shaveo spoke about a time when his cousin Latonia went missing in those same woods years ago. Nobody ever found her or any evidence suggesting what could have happened. A shudder ran down my spine as I considered her fate and our current circumstance. Without warning, a monstrous growl reverberated outside our house. Shattering glass echoed chillingly inside, and Anakona nearly dropped the lantern he was holding. We shared a momentary glance before frantically rushing to arm ourselves with whatever we could find, a hunting knife, a rusty hatchet, even an old baseball bat left by some kids who visited two summers ago. As we prepared ourselves for what seemed like an inevitable attack, the creature prowled around the outside. It screeched at us, each noise it produced becoming more terrifying than the last. Just when we thought there could be no end to our nightmare, we noticed that it seemed reluctant to step into our home's dimmed lights. A desperate plan came together in my mind. Stand near a light source, I yelled at Anakona. He looked at me puzzled but obliged anyway. The creature hesitated just outside of reach while we huddled near safety. As the adrenaline surged through me, I made an impulsive decision much to Anakona's shock. I switched off my flashlight and plunged the room into darkness, baiting the creature towards us. A bead of sweat trickled down my forehead as I prepared for another attack. The creature lunged toward the rapidly vanishing light, and in an instant, its gnarled limbs and grotesque face were illuminated for us to see. My hands shook violently as I raised my hunting rifle. Barely able to hold the rifle steady, I took a deep breath and aimed at the creature's vile, drooling mouth. The beast was an amalgamation of matted fur, patches of scaly skin, and jagged teeth its hulking form eluding classification. I pulled the trigger just as it lunged at Anacona. The bullet tore through flesh and bone, spraying a mixture of blood and saliva onto our faces. The creature's momentum caused it to crash into Anacona, slamming both of them against the wall. I rushed toward them as the monstrosity convulsed before finally lying still. Get off him! I yelled, grappling with the creature's twitching carcass and throwing it aside. Anakona gasped for air, pain etched on his face as he clutched his ribs. Are you okay? It got me, but I'll live. Anakona winced. Thanks to you. We examined our surroundings broken glass littered the floor from shattered windows, furniture knocked over during the struggle. Our once secure home now looked like a war zone. We couldn't stay here any longer. As Anakona gritted his teeth and struggled to his feet, I tried to think of where we could go that might offer some semblance of safety. At this moment, we needed assistance more than anything else. Unable to drive due to my shaky hands and panic state, Anakona took charge behind the wheel as we sped toward town. There had to be someone who could help us someone who knew about this creature or had fought similar threats before. Entering town, we sought out a nearby medical center where Anakona could get checked out and patched up, 
if necessary. As he received treatment for his injured ribs, I called out for help using my cell phone and phoned friends in town who might have useful information. It was odd that none of them had ever mentioned encountering anything like the creature we had faced, but perhaps they simply didn't want to scare their loved ones. Finally, Tony, a local who worked as a wildlife ranger, took my call. Fear gripped me as I relayed our horrifying ordeal to him, leaving out none of the gory details. Tony assured me that he had never seen or heard of a beast fitting such a description, but would ask around to check if anyone else knew anything about it. Several agonizing days passed. Anakona's wounds began healing and authorities thoroughly searched our property for evidence of the mysterious creature. The investigation revealed nothing conclusive, leaving law enforcement puzzled and unable to provide any helpful explanations. I spent hours on my laptop searching for information on strange creatures like the one we encountered but came up empty-handed. No one seemed to know what it was or where it had come from. Then, on the fourth day since our incident, Tony contacted us with some unexpected news. An old friend in law enforcement shared with him that there had been reports of similar beasts attacking people in remote areas over the last few months across multiple states. But details were scarce and inconsistent. The only commonality among the stories was that light seemed to be a deterrent. This chilling revelation left us questioning whether we would ever feel safe again or discover what these creatures were. But at least for now, we felt somewhat reassured that our fear and vigilance had gained validation. As Anakona and I tried to put our lives back together and move past this traumatizing experience, we vowed never to forget those who hadn't made it when faced with such an abomination whoever their faces may have been. We remain committed to staying aware of any emerging information about these malevolent beings while holding on to hope that some kind of protection against them could be found. But until then, we would always carry with us the memory of that fateful night ready to stand vigilant, to act if needed, for ourselves and others unfortunate enough to cross paths with these monsters that lurked in the darkness. I stumbled upon the grisly scene while taking a stroll through the familiar trails of Coconino National Forest in Arizona, my home since childhood. The victim, a hiker by the name of Ellery Whitestone, lay mangled near a ravine. My name is Kachita Talchief, and that day I was only trying to find peace in nature's embrace. I called for help on my cell phone, but the reception was unreliable. Faced with no other option, I decided not to leave Ellery alone and waited until the signal improved. While I waited and pondered my own life as an artist who barely made ends meet, something caught my eye. Small footprints trailed further down the ravine too small for a human. As I continued down the ravine with caution, Escorted by some fellow hikers who had joined to help after hearing my panic-filled voice echoing through the area, we couldn't help but nervously joke about what might have caused such trauma to our once serene forest. But as we navigated deeper into the wilderness, fear crept in. In front of our eyes lay another mutilated body, this one half-concealed beneath nearby brush. This victim, Delmar Red Dirt, showed similar injuries to Ellery, torn flesh and shattered bones. With each grisly discovery, our unease grew exponentially. The footprints grew harder to follow as they blended into the forest floor. For hours we searched and dreaded finding what might be lurking just out of sight until we reached an abnormally dense thicket. That's when we heard it, an unnatural growl that resonated within us. Before we could react, a terrifying creature lunged from the undergrowth, a horrifying mix of sinewy muscle and feral malice that defied description. 
razor-sharp claws gleamed in its grotesque limbs as it swiped through the air. As we scattered, the creature leapt onto one of our group members, Gervais' cuffling tree, rending him limb from limb. Its primal noise mixed with Gervais's last, guttural scream and echoed through the desolate landscape. I knew I had to escape this nightmarish reality, so I gathered every ounce of courage within me and sprinted towards an opening in the trees. As I glanced back, with heart pounding desperately in my chest, I spotted the remaining hikers doing the same, but not all of them would make it out alive. My legs burned as I ran towards safety, every nerve in my body screaming desperation and fear. Somehow, I could still hear that monstrous creature tearing through the woods behind me as it pursued my fellow hikers. I continued to run with no plan other than survival, no time for contemplation. A gunshot rang through the air then. Glancing back once more, I saw Lana Pritchett brandishing a pistol she must have been carrying for protection. She fired at the creature, momentarily stopping its relentless pursuit. But it only seemed to aggravate it further. It immediately turned its ire on Lana and attacked with renewed ferocity. She fired again but missed desperately as tears streamed down her face. It pounced on her and tore into her flesh with an animalistic fury that made bile rise in my throat. My own body was quickly reaching its limits while despair flooded every part of me. As the creature finished with Lana, it turned to face the rest of our group members, who were now vulnerable targets. Sensing no other option, those with cell phones immediately tried to call for help. However, an eerie silence followed their unsuccessful attempts, as they realized there was no signal in this desolate part of the wilderness. In that moment, one hiker named Benjamin managed to scramble to his feet. He picked up a massive tree branch, mustering all his strength to swing it at the creature's head. The impact slowed the monster down but failed to keep it from continuing its relentless pursuit. With renewed vigor, the creature charged again this time, focusing on Benjamin. Having used all his strength and energy in that one fleeting act of defiance, he merely stared blankly at the approaching horror. The monster lunged at him and tore into his flesh mercilessly, rending his body just as it had with Lana and Gervais. Benjamin now joined their list of victims in what can only be described as a nightmare beyond comprehension. As I continued running through the woods with the survivors of my group, I looked back one last time to see the distorted face of Benjamin staring blankly through bloody pulp. We stumbled upon an old abandoned ranger station not too far from where we were before our ordeal started. Upon entering, we found a phone hooked up to a landline that might still be functional. I desperately dialed for help while my fellow survivors barricaded the door behind us. Thankfully, my call connected, and I frantically relayed our location and situation to the dispatcher on the other end. As I did so, I couldn't help but listen intently for any sounds of pursuit coming from outside. Multiple gunshots rang through the night as local law enforcement arrived just in time to put down the monstrous threat that had torn our group apart. Deemed too dangerous to allow its existence known to the public, its mangled remains were destroyed, and all evidence was gathered to keep our nightmarish encounter away from public knowledge. We mourned for our fallen comrades during a quiet ceremony conducted weeks later. The authorities never released exact details about what attacked us that night, and we were advised to remain silent about the ghastly creature. Our lives would never be the same after that expedition. But despite the trauma experienced, as survivors, we were left with a grim reminder of those taken from us far too soon. Laying awake at night pondering the horrors that befell my friends, Gervais Cuffling Tree, Lana Pritchett, and Benjamin Carter. I can only hope they've found solace in their deaths. And although their ordeal ended in terror and tragedy, 
knowing they had faced their impending doom with courage gives some measure of solace. As for me and the other survivors, as much as we'd like to forget what unfolded during that fateful camping trip, we're bound by an unspoken bond. We hold on to each other's pain as a reminder of what we endured together and of our departed friends who met their untimely end in that desolate wilderness. Years passed, and I would occasionally meet with those who survived the attack. We would exchange knowing glances, conveying silent empathy and shared suffering. Our lives moved on, but the memory of that horrendous creature lingers at the back of our minds, reminding us that some nightmares continue to exist, just beyond the veil of comprehension. Eventually, I came across a detailed account of a similar encounter documented decades earlier, an unknown creature which would prey upon unsuspecting groups amidst desolate woods. The eyewitnesses described its grotesque limbs and relentless attacks eerily similar to ours. Realizing that generations had suffered through such traumatic events, it became apparent that these tragedies were preventable only if someone had drawn a connection between those prior accounts and the reality of our harrowing experience. While the horror of that night will forever haunt me and my fellow survivors, sharing this tale may serve to warn future generations of the potential dangers lurking in remote wilderness areas and perhaps deter innocent lives from suffering as we did at the hands, or claws, of a malevolent creature that was never meant to exist. I stepped out of the creaky cabin, shivering at the sudden gust of wind that brushed against my skin. Ah, uh, thanks for today's wake-up call. I whispered, chuckling to myself. My name is Lockney Woolfeather, and this is my eerie tale at Shadow Reservation. Living close to nature was always my preference, never mind the occasional inconvenience or unexpected visitor. There was a special bond one felt with Mother Earth, being a Native American descendant. A brief walk through the dew-covered grasslands led me to the dense forest where I usually took regular morning strolls. The chirping birds melodiously accompanied me as I trekked the beaten path. However, something felt terribly off today. An overwhelming sense of unease slowly made its way into my gut. I tried shaking it off by thinking of pleasant memories from childhood spent exploring these very woods, but this anxiety quashed any recreation efforts. A scream ripped through the air stiffening me in place as a mix of fear and survival instincts coursed through my veins. My breath hitched as the scream persisted. It sounded like Martha Morningstar, a fellow tribal member who had ventured out for her early morning routine. No sooner than I'd started sprinting toward where her pained voice echoed did I collide with another tribe mate, Michael Howlingwolf. He didn't need to ask why we both bore expressions of terror. It was clear we were in danger. We have to help Martha. Michael gasped before we resumed running towards the source of her agonizing cries. Reaching a small clearing that had earlier hosted laughter amongst friends now hosted a horror scene like no other. Blood soaked the ground below us as we looked around frantically for our fallen comrade. Michael became paranoid, taking out his hunting knife as if anticipating an imminent attack. The damp soil indented underfoot as if something monstrous had been standing there moments before. The indentation led to the heart of the dense foliage. We vigilantly approached, stumbling upon a creature we had only heard whispers about in our wildest nightmares. The villainous beast towered over us, its grotesque mutated form overshadowed by a blood-stained maw that dribbled with the remnants of its last meal, Martha. Seeing it up close was a painful reality in contrast to stories kept alive by our ancestors for centuries. Its twisted, misshapen limbs distorted any sense of what might once have been natural anatomy, as every movement echoed as if bone grinded against bone. No time remained for grief at this new reality. Michael and I swiftly turned back, desperate to inform the tribal elders. 
both of us unsheathed our knives, Michael pulling out his handgun as well while we sprinted for dear life. The beast's guttural roar rang out behind us, hinting at the pursuit to follow. Back at the tribe, our people surrounded us with concern and despair as we relayed the nightmare we just lived. Prey had transformed into predator at Shadow Reservation. Centuries-old tales revived in morbid truth. A once peaceful sanctuary was now plunged into panic. News spread like wildfire that Martha had been murdered by a frightening entity that bore an aura of malevolence. Needless to say, other families confined themselves in their homes while warriors patrolled the boundaries like a ghostly plague haunted their minds. Lies crawled their way into conversations, inciting fear among families and friends. There were whispers of new victims and treacherous hunts that escalated tensions within our community. However, changes began manifesting beyond carefully guarded patrols and houses locked behind ferocious determination. Friendships started slipping away. Tribesmates looked upon one another with suspicion instead of camaraderie. Chaos consumed each day. Weeks went by without resolution as hope drained from every heart like sand slipping through cupped hands. In that suffocating atmosphere, my path crossed the monster again, horror incarnate in the form of a nightmarish beast stalking the shadows beyond our village borders. I spotted the creature lurking on the outskirts of our village. Its spine-chilling presence sent our warriors into a frenzy their war cries echoing through the night as they readied themselves for whatever was about to come. The creature moved on all fours, its limbs twisted at unnatural angles and covered in matted fur, emitting a foul stench that immobilized anyone who came too close. Knowing we were in grave danger, I thought to call for help. But it was clear that those outside our tribe would dismiss our plight as mere superstition and refuse to lend support. We had only ourselves to rely on. As time went by, we realized that simply defending our boundaries would not be enough. The creature would not go away. Each nightfall brought more fear and dread to our hearts as we braced ourselves for another attack. The once familiar faces in our village now wore a constant mix of terror and exhaustion. The warriors were growing weary from nightly encounters with the beast. These confrontations were out of necessity rather than choice, as the creature was relentless in its pursuit of us. Most of these brave men were injured from the vicious attacks, gashes that defied any attempts at healing and bouts of fever that left them weakened and unable to fight. Eventually, one warrior decided on a desperate plan involving himself as bait in order to trap the creature. He bravely sprinted towards it, his voice rising above the cacophony of warrior shouts and the growls of the beast. By drawing its attention solely on himself, he hoped to provide a swift opening for the tribe to end its terror once and for all. As he sprinted closer and closer, it became apparent that this proposal may not have been thoroughly thought out. There was no escape route for our brave warrior. Without hesitating, he lunged at the creature with his knife raised high. An eerie silence surrounded them on impact, until we heard the heart-wrenching scream as the creature's claws tore through his vestiges. The rest of the tribe now turned their full attention to the creature, intent on finishing it off in one swift blow. The monster twisted and snarled as it fought us off, seemingly unharmed by the onslaught of blades and bullets raining upon it. It wasn't until every warrior had expended all of their ammunition and weapons that they backed away, panting heavily. The creature lay defeated on the ground, oozing with a substance that couldn't be blood, for it was black and thick with a metallic glint. As I looked around me at our broken community, still reeling in shock and disbelief that it was finally over, I couldn't help but feel a deep sadness for everything we'd gone through, for after all, our lives would never be the same. The death of Martha and that brave warrior who gave his life so willingly weighed heavily on our collective conscience. Injured warriors were tethered to bandages soaked with water, cooling down their heated bodies. I tried my best to remain stoic. The nightmare we had been living was finally over, 
We had survived this never-before-seen creature and put an end to its atrocities against our people. The memory of those we lost, both living and dead, will forever be etched in our minds, serving as a reminder of the unspeakable horrors we've endured. Over time, those who survived regrouped and began tending to their own wounds and those inflicted on the tribe itself. Efforts were made to return to everyday life. Although there will always be a void left by those who were cruelly taken from us during these dark times, we remember them with love and honor their memory. Despite facing an unknown force like no other, even though calling for help may not have altered our outcome, we rose as one in defense of our tribe. Safety has been restored and the remaining civilians can sleep without fear of the shadows beyond their village boundaries. They now have a newfound sense of empowerment and resilience as they forge ahead into the future, forever triumphant in the battle against the monster that has plagued their existence. In time, our ordeal will become nothing more than a hushed whisper, the details losing clarity as they fade into the annals of history. And yet, we will remember. I turned the corner at Gaviota Creek, deep within the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, astonished by what I had just witnessed. My name is Taylor Aquita, a native to these lands, and today started just like any other ordinary day until a terrible scream shattered the silence of the woods. A few hours ago, I would have told you about my uneventful life as an electrician and father of two, while tending to our small family garden a normal existence for most people around these parts. The morning light filtered through the dense canopy above. I had been out hiking with a small group of locals when we stumbled upon an unimaginable scene. Shano Ishii and his wife Taya were beside themselves with horror. Spread out before us was the bloody wreckage of what appeared to be a recent murder. We hesitated for a moment, disbelieving our eyes as we surveyed the aftermath. The body was mutilated beyond recognition. It was too horrifying to describe. A chill ran down my spine. This was nothing like I've ever seen before. I knew we had to go back and report it, though being in this remote part of the reservation meant we were out of cell range. Shiano nervously announced that he'd stayed behind to watch over the gruesome scene while we went to seek help. Taya led the group on our way back. We couldn't shake off this dreadful feeling something inhuman had committed this atrocious act. As darkness fell, we were all scattered, separated by the rapidly growing shadows in these unfamiliar woods. My heartbeat quickened as I scrambled through twisted roots and overgrown branches trying to find anyone familiar or a sign leading back to safety. When I finally found another member of our group, Sheila Anave, who was also lost, we decided that it was everyone's best interest if we returned to the crime scene. We couldn't shake off the sinking feeling of what awaited us when we got there. After hours of endless searching, we finally crept back to find Shiano still guarding. But now he was frozen in terror. He told us how he endured endless taunting throughout the night from a monstrous creature lurking just outside his vision. Listening to his frantic description of its drooling maw, sharp claws, and grotesque figure, I knew it was beyond our understanding. As the sun set again, it was clear that we needed another plan. Our group must regroup and return home. We decided to take turns on watch, hoping to defend ourselves against whatever stalked us through these desolate woods. It was impossible not to feel worry mount as the weight of our situation bore down on us. Shortly after my turn as lookout, I heard disturbing sounds in the distance, a combination of snapping branches, guttural growls, and agonizing screams. Suddenly, the piercing shriek echoed through the woods again, but this time closer. Anave uttered a trembling whisper. Who's out there? His voice barely audible above the growing chaos as the terrifying reality dawned on him. One of our own was now in danger. The blood-streaked moon cast an eerie light on Taya's lifeless body as we found her. 
another original character taken from us by this merciless beast while we had been powerless to defend her. Determined not to lose anyone else, I knew aid was our last hope before its insatiable appetite claimed further victims among my neighbors and friends who thought they would find safety in numbers. As I stumbled away from that gruesome tableau in search of help once more, my heart pounding like a crazed metronome, I finally managed to reconnect with a cell phone network near a beaten hillside trail. I dialed 911 and begged for assistance as terror gripped me, trying not to break down as I recounted the horrors we've witnessed. The responder on the line offered some feeble comfort amidst her shock, assuring me that help was mobilizing quickly. But as I hung up the call, a distant howl reached my ears, a haunting reminder of the unstoppable force lurking just beyond our field of vision. I couldn't waste any time. I had to continue my race against an invisible enemy, forever driven by dread as an inescapable feeling sank into my very soul. With every second spent running from the creature, it became harder to navigate the terrain. The foliage was growing dense, and fatigue was setting in. I knew that Anave and the others needed me, but my energy was draining away quickly. Nearby, I spotted a house with boarded-up windows, and without thinking of the potential consequences, I sprinted towards the seemingly abandoned structure, hoping to take refuge for a few moments. As I approached the house, I noticed its dilapidated state and wondered whether it would offer any protection against the relentless beast. Once inside, I caught my breath and decided to make one last attempt to call for help. This time, I managed to reach a search and rescue team who alerted me that they were only a few miles away from my location. With renewed hope for survival and rescue close at hand, I glanced out of one of the cracked windows. To my horror, standing not far from the confines of my temporary sanctuary, were several mutilated bodies strewn across the ground. As I stared at them in despair, knowing that those we failed to save had suffered unthinkable fates at the hands of this abominable creature, a sudden movement caught my eye. In that brief moment of terror, my gaze met the brute that had been hunting us relentlessly. The monster appeared as an enormous wolf-like being with coal-black fur as dark as midnight, sharp claws coated in fresh blood, and a snarl revealing a set of teeth capable of tearing flesh with ease. Its eyes, void of any semblance of compassion or understanding, locked on mine for the first time since our dire encounter began. With the weight of absolute dread upon me, I held back a scream as I watched it move menacingly towards me. However, before it could make its next gruesome attack upon our group or me personally, sirens pierced the air. The creature froze and tilted its head as though listening, trying to make sense of the approaching sound. Just then, bright lights appeared in the distance, and the roaring engine of a helicopter filled the atmosphere. The search and rescue team had arrived. As though sensing an end to its killing spree, the creature turned and bolted deeper into the woods with incredible speed. I watched as it vanished from view, feeling relief course through me as it disappeared. We would be safe, for now. After explaining our harrowing ordeal to the search and rescue team, they contacted local authorities who arranged for our group to be safely transported away from this nightmarish experience. Details were scarce as we tried our best to recount that which we could hardly comprehend ourselves. The days following our escape brought forth more questions than answers. The authorities conducted their search for any evidence of the creature we had encountered but found nothing conclusive within the dense forest. As we each struggled to come to terms with what we had endured and mourned Taya's loss, unable to comprehend how one of our own was taken from us so brutally, one thing became clear. What happened in those woods would haunt us forever. I know that out there, in that labyrinth of trees and shadows, that creature still roams free. Though I dare not speak its name or try to understand its motives or desires— I remain ever vigilant should it decide to strike again. For now, all we can do is find a way to move forward with heavy hearts as we honor Taya's memory 
and hope that people understand what truly lies beneath the cover of darkness among those frightening branches. I stumbled upon the mutilated body lying in the arid landscape of Monument Valley. An eerie sense of dread washed over me. Blood pooled around my cousin Ezekiel, and his mouth was agape as if screaming for help that never came. My name is Thomas White River, and I live on this Native American reservation, a place steeped with history but now filled with fear. The weight of tragedy plagued our once vibrant community as missing person cases spiked in recent times. Having no idea who or what did this to Ezekiel, I picked up my phone to call for help. Unfortunately, the reception in this area was as desolate as the landscape itself, leaving me stranded with this gruesome scene. Days before, we gathered at Ezekiel's house to reminisce about our childhood. We shared embarrassing stories and laughed until our sides hurt. It was a night where the simple joys of life were untarnished by darkness. Little did I know that my cousin would soon no longer be part of those memories. Surveying the gruesome scene further, it was clear that something animalistic had attacked him. Whatever did this left deep gashes and a seemingly endless trail of blood. Searching the area for any clues led me into a densely wooded forest nearby. Was it possible that some creature from local legends could be responsible? The deeper I ventured into the woods, the more uneasy I became. Leaves crunching underfoot echoed through the air, creating a chilling soundtrack accompanying my search for answers. The distant howling of wolves added to the disquiet encircling me. I stumbled upon a makeshift campsite near a secluded creek. A disarray of various items and scattered belongings suggested another victim had been here before meeting their fate. A clawed handprint marred one of the tent walls, leaving me even more perturbed. Could it be a bear? Somehow, it didn't seem right. Determined to bring justice to those who fell victim to this unknown beast, I enlisted the help of my friend James Two Feathers a skilled tracker with an uncanny intuition for navigating the wilderness. As we investigated further, we discovered more victims of these heinous crimes. The scars left behind were like nothing we had seen before. Both human and animal victims alike displayed unusual wounds that defied explanation. The pain they endured was evident from the expression their dead bodies wore faces etched with agony and pure terror. As my heart raced, adrenaline coursed through my veins, and every noise made me jump. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as a guttural snarl filled the air behind me. I had walked right into the lair of whatever had killed so many. Horrified by what now confronted us, I caught my first glimpse of our adversary, a hybrid creature, a fusion of man and beast, sparse for covering mangled limbs teeth sharpened to fine points, while the hungry eyes trained on us with predatory intent. My hands shook as I reached for my hunting knife, grasping it tight in anticipation. The hybrid creature towered over us, snapping at us with its razor-sharp teeth. James and I knew we couldn't fight this monster. It was too powerful for us. We also knew we had to survive somehow. I turned to James and said, We have to run now. James nodded in agreement, and without a second thought, we sprinted in opposite directions. The creature hesitated for a moment, sizing up its prey, before choosing to focus on pursuing me. As I ran through the forest, dodging branches and stumbling on rocks hidden beneath fallen leaves, my thoughts raced with fear and terror. Deep down, I knew there was no way I could outrun this beast by mere human speed, but it was my only hope for survival. Too afraid to even think about reaching for my phone to call for help, as it would require stopping or slowing down, I ran with everything I had. Suddenly, 
the creature lunged forward and caught my leg with its massive clawed hand. Pain exploded in my calf as it tore through my flesh. My scream echoed throughout the still forest as I collapsed onto the ground. The creature stood over me, snarling and raising its claws for the final blow. Just then, James appeared near the edge of the woods with a shotgun aimed at the monster's hulking form. He fired three rounds into its side as fast as he could pull the trigger. The creature howled in pain, releasing my leg from its grip. It hesitated for a moment before choosing whether to attack James or me next. Instead of lunging towards either of us, it seemed to recognize that it was outnumbered and now outgunned. With one last growl, the creature retreated into the dense forest. As James helped me to my feet, supporting me with his shoulder, we knew we had to find our way back to civilization quickly before blood loss or potential infection took hold. We cautiously made our way to the outskirts of the forest, with every step sending agonizing pain through my injured leg. Finally, reaching a nearby road, we managed to flag down a passing car. Grateful for the driver's assistance, they hurriedly took us to the nearest hospital. Our ordeal wasn't over yet, though. The staff questioned us about what happened in the forest. We tried to explain, but how could we describe such a creature without sounding insane? As the doctors treated my wound and sent me on my way with crutches and heavy gauze, my thoughts turned again to those who had fallen victim before me. What had they suffered at the hands of this abomination? The truth about the sinister forest would likely never be uncovered or believed by many. The creature, half man and half beast, may never fully show itself again. It may retreat into its dark world of shadows for what may appear to be an eternity. But I know that it exists and is always lurking beneath the tree's canopy, waiting for its next prey. James and I are forever bound by this experience that cost us our innocence but bought us survival. As time passes, we will remember this twisted walk through nightmare woods, our desperate flight from a creature too terrifying to comprehend. We have learned one terrifying truth that may haunt us for the rest of our lives. Some terrifying creatures exist only in darkness hidden away from prying human eyes until they are ready to strike again with silent fury. And though we don't know when or where it might stumble upon its next victim, somewhere deep within us both lies an unsettling fear, knowing that it is still out there, watching, waiting, hunting in silence. <laughs>